I think we can go ahead and get started. It's 545. Um, before we officially begin the meeting, we will hear a little bit from Porter O'Neill about our process for the evening. Thank you, Mayor. Good evening, everybody. My name is Porter Arneal, and as Mayor Ananda said, I'll be facilitating the Zoom video portion of the meeting tonight. With me here is Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk. She will work alongside Mayor Ananda to facilitate the meeting proceedings. This meeting is being recorded and broadcast on the City's YouTube channel and public access to cable channel 25. During the meeting, please mute yourself by clicking on the microphone icon found on the lower left-hand side of the Zoom menu next to the video icon. When you are muted, a red line will appear over the icon. Muting your microphone during the meeting will make it easier for everyone to hear. You'll just have to remember to unmute if and when you want to speak. In some cases, I may mute or unmute people as needed. Each time you speak, please remember to state your name and title for the benefit of those listening remotely. In the menu, you can also turn your camera on or off by clicking the video icon. For the purposes of this public meeting, please keep your video on during the meeting. If you're participating by phone, you can click star six to unmute your phone. For those using Zoom, somewhere on your screen, you will see a choice to toggle between speaker and gallery view. Speaker view shows the active speaker. Gallery view tiles all the meeting participants. And now I'll turn it back over to Mayor Ananda. It's Mayor Nanda. Thank you, Porter. Uh, we will begin by taking roll call. Um, Vice Mayor Finkeldine? Here. Commissioner Shipley? Here. Commissioner Bully? Here. Commissioner Larson? Here. All right, we are all present and accounted for. Welcome to the July 14th Lawrence City Commission meeting. Before we jump into our agenda, we will also hear from our clerk, Sherry Riedemann. Thank you, Mayor. Again, this is Sherry Riedemann, City Clerk, and I'm going to provide a few reminders to everyone to ensure that the provisions of the Kansas Open Meetings Act are met. <clears throat> Commissioners, you must remember to state your name and title each time you speak. All motions will need to be stated clearly. After a motion is made and seconded, the Mayor will call on Commissioners individually to provide their vote. Mayor, you will then need to announce whether the motion carried and the count of the vote. Various members of city staff are present via Zoom and they must also state their name and title each time they speak. Members of the public are allowed to speak to certain agenda items and these items are specifically noted on the meeting agenda. Individuals who signed up in advance to provide public comment remotely will be called upon by name when you are called on, please unmute your listening device and state your name before speaking. The regular three minute time limit will apply. The mayor will then call for in-person public comment for those without access to technology options. Staff present will direct you to the podium to speak following social distancing and safety protocols. And again, the regular three minute time limit will apply. Thank you. Mayor Ananda, thank you, Sherry. So we will um, begin our agenda now. Um, the first item on our agenda is to approve our agenda. The City Commission reserves the right to amend, supplement, or reorder the agenda during the meeting. Are there any changes that a member of the Commission would like to make to the agenda? This is Commissioner Bowley. I move approval of the agenda. Commissioner Larson, second. This is Mayor Ananda. We have a motion from Commissioner Bully, a second from Commissioner Larson. Commissioner Bully. Aye. Mr. Larson? Aye. Commissioner Shipley? Aye. Vice Mayor Finkel Aye. Fernanda, aye. That passes unanimously. We are ready to move on to our consent agenda. Please note all matters listed below on the consent agenda are considered under one motion and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion on those items. If discussion is desired, that item will be removed from the consent agenda and will be considered separately. Only those items noted with yellow highlight, bold print, and italics print are eligible for live public comment, and the public will be limited to three minutes for comments. Are there any items that a member of the commission wishes to pull from the consent agenda? Okay. And we, we had no public comment on any of these items, so we can accept a motion. This is Vice Mayor Finkeldy. I would move for approval of the consent agenda. Commissioner Larson, second. 
Ms. Mayor Ananda, we have a motion from Vice Mayor Finkeldye, a second from Commissioner Larson. Vice Mayor Finkeldye? Aye. Commissioner Larson? Aye. Commissioner Bully? Aye. Commissioner Shipley? Aye. Aye, that passes unanimously. We are ready for public comment. General public comment will be accepted in written form only. General public comments must be submitted 24 hours prior to the start of the meeting. Email mail are acceptable and written comments can also be dropped in the utility billing drop box located at the cutout of 6th Street in New Hampshire. All comments should be marked for the city commission. To submit general public comment by email, email ccagendas at lawrenceks.org or by mail, City Hall, 6 East, East 6th Street, Lawrence, Kansas, 66044. We did receive one item of public comment this evening um, from Chad Baisdahl concerning concerns regarding staff direction of cleaning during the pandemic. I would request that we have staff address this comment, um, pass it along to the city manager. The next item on our agenda is commission items. Are there future agenda items that any commissioner would wish to add? Any future work session items? Any other items? Um, we'll look at the calendar next. Are there any items that a member of the commission would like to discuss or need to add to the calendar? This is Vice Mayor Finkeldye. Uh, just to note, um, I'm going to be out of town on the 28th, uh, touring around Kansas um, on a family vacation. I think I'll be able to call in as everyone else will, but I just wanted to note that, that I'll be not in my normal place. So if mm -hmm. internet's not good, it might be a little difficult for me to be there. Anything else? Okay, we are ready to adjourn. Mr. Parson, I move to adjourn. Vice Mayor Finkeldye, second. There's a motion from Commissioner, this is Mayor Nanda, there's a motion, not a commotion, a motion from Commissioner Larson, a second from Vice Mayor Finkeldye. Commissioner Larson? Aye. Vice Mayor Finkeldye? Aye. Commissioner Shipley? Aye. Commissioner Bully? Aye. Mayor Nanda passes unanimously. We are adjourned and ready to begin our work session. The work session provides an opportunity for the City Commission to discuss items in greater detail. As a general practice, the commission will not make decisions on items presented during this time. Rather, they will refer the items to staff for follow-up if necessary. Work session topics are eligible for live public comment and the public will be limited to three minutes for comments. Individuals wishing to provide live public comment must register as outlined on the top of the agenda. The item that we have on our work session this evening is to receive the city manager's recommended budget for 2021 and provide direction as appropriate. Good evening, uh, Mayor and Commissioners. My name is Danielle Bushcutter. Um, I'm going to be serving as the facilitator of uh, the budget presentation this evening. So I'm going to go ahead and share my screen and we can jump into uh, the presentation. There we go. Um, so um, this evening, uh, you all are going to receive the 2021 recommended um, budget. Um, with the kind of um, new process that we are in with these virtual meetings, um, we're hoping that we can answer most of your questions at the end of the presentation. Um, that way you all can really kind of direct the conversation. Uh, we also have a number of slides to get through as um, I'm sure you all have already seen and gone through. Um, so we do have a number of staff from all the various departments also on the line to help answer any questions that you all have. Um, so with that, uh, this is kind of the general presentation outline for this evening. Um, Craig is going to provide kind of that general budget overview, uh, those key considerations, some of those timing things um, that we um, are experiencing with this particular budget. Um, and then after he's done with his remarks, Jeremy is going to go through uh, the revenue assumptions um, along with kind of a fund overview. Um, as well as giving um, a, a presentation on the capital improvement plan, the vehicle and equipment replacement plan, as well as the maintenance plan and, and some of those um, final few items related to 
um, the impact on um, taxpayers in this case, and then finally um, a brief overview of those outside agencies. This is me or not. I'm going to interrupt for just a second. Remind folks to mute their line. Not yet done so. There's, there's some background noise happening. Thank you, Danielle. Absolutely. Danielle Bushkutta, Budget and Strategic Initiatives Administrator. Um, we will then round out the presentation with the departmental um, budgets, and I will actually go through each of those just so we don't um, have to um, pass it off from staff member to staff member. So I will provide a very high level um, overview. And then, like I mentioned, we have staff here from um, all of our departments to answer uh, any questions that you all may have. Just as a brief reminder of kind of our calendar, um, obviously tonight we're presenting the city manager's recommended budget uh, on July 28th. Uh, that is when we will set the maximum expenditure limit. Um, and then following that on August 11th is when we have the public hearing scheduled. And then the, uh, we typically have the first reading of the budget ordinance also on that uh, agenda. And then the 18th would be the second and final reading. Um, we also want to make sure that people know how to participate in this process. Um, so obviously those um, who are able to are welcome to join um, and participate in these meetings or submit written correspondence as well. So with that, I am going to mute myself um, and, and pass it over to Craig. Thanks, Danielle. Um, I am excited to be presenting this budget. This is my first since my arrival last summer. Um, as you can imagine, it is uh, very different than I had hoped and uh, very different than anyone I think uh, could have imagined um, in this past year. Uh, nevertheless, uh, this is a product of hundreds, if not thousands of hours of um, collective hours of time and work by the finance and budget team, uh, the city manager's office and every single department, um, which I hope you see reflected in the work. Um, through each twist and turn that we've had over these last four months, uh, everyone has stepped up. We've had to, um, completely reconsider um, many different things uh, over the last few months, as I know you have and, and every business has and every, every household has. Um, so, but I'm proud of the dynamic um, uh, work that, uh, that we did here and the people that uh, supported uh, the work to go into this budget. Um, yeah, this may not be what we hoped, but I believe this proposal serves as our, our community well and I hope gives you, the commission, a very strong and useful foundation Free work to turn my recommendations into our collective plan for the next fiscal year for our city. Um, as proud as we are of this product that we are, um, we're presenting here tonight, um, our goal is to support you in adopting a budget that you feel best serves the community. And our job from tonight on is to help you in that work. So I'm going to go through here just uh, very broadly um, kind of some of the challenges that are obvious, but the way they impacted us. Uh, and what this plan uh, kind of lays out. So um, the budget process is really intended, though it has a lot of numbers in it, it's, it's, it's how we prioritize and how we uh, get the work done that the community has decided it wants to have done. Um, and um, those are aligned in the, where, the direction we are going is aligning the budget with our strategic plan. Um, we need to identify the uh, priority initiatives that we understand we need to address in the community and con continuity of services. Um, and we need to put this all into a larger picture. This is a time when we talk about, each year we talk about what is our business plan, what do we need to accomplish as an organization and how should we accomplish it. Um, it also uh, contextualizes the financial decisions and policy directions. So, um, We'd like to have these things, these are important to us, and then we have to tell you, uh, give you the plan for how do we execute those things and how do we deliver um, the promises to the community that we make. Um, it also is a time for us to put into context this next fiscal year into our longer term planning. So there are things that we, um, we have the advantage of knowing we're going to be in this business or doing this work um, perpetually. And so we have the advantage of looking ahead and, and saying, if we do it this way this year, um, we need to be prepared for the, con the uh, consequences or the advantages that that brings uh, in the following years.
Um, so the timing of this um, is really inconvenient this year because um, we were so excited to bring uh, the strategic plan uh, forward and then really build a, a, a really wonderful plan uh, that was around our priorities. Um, but the uh, August 25th certification date is fixed in Kansas and we have to do that. So we had to get it to you and start the process, which uh, puts the cart uh, somewhat be before the horse. Um, we began our, our work in January um, of last year. So just as soon as we get into the new fiscal year, we're starting to prepare for the next one. Um, and the projections um, are made um, well in advance. So um, because of this kind of almost 18 months in advance, we don't have a good idea of what our projections are going to really be based on. And so we adjust those over the course of the, the budget planning process before we, we send it to you, but it, it starts out really not having, having to look way ahead on some of our, um, um, our revenue forecasts and even our expenditure forecasts. Um, obviously COVID-19 was a big complication in that. Um, so um, I, I called this in my transmittal uh, letter to you a placeholder budget. And I mean that because it does put the cart before the horse. Um, we were doing a really great job of connecting, I think, with the community around budget priorities and around strategic priorities for through our Lawrence Listens process. Um, it it was uh, getting us to a place where we um, we had made connection with people I don't think that had uh, traditionally um, been involved, and we were very proud of that. And then everything kind of came to a, a halt. So um, when that did, we had to move on without knowing exactly what the priorities would be. Um, the, up, the strategic plan in a priority-based budgeting uh, system that we've been building towards um, is really critical. And so uh, the strategic plan will help us um, take this plan, um, make a, a movement with this plan through the mid-budget. Um, Jeremy Wilmoth and I, um, he's, he's been here a, a year longer than me, but we both agreed that a quarterly budget amendment process is a best practice so that we're having um, regular adjustment uh, conversations with the commission so that you understand how the conditions change, both on the expenditure side as well as the revenue side, and we can have conversations about reprioritizing within the budget. Um, that is nor a normal process that you should be expecting us to see from us uh, going forward. But in this year, because um, the strategic plan is going to happen after the budget recommendation, um, we are recommending that we uh, use the quarterly budget process to potentially reprogram significantly after we have our strategic priorities uh, established with the strategic planning process. So we have plenty of time to do that. We can't exceed our maximum revenue cap, but we do think that this will be a year where we do have um, um, re-envisioned, re restarted, um, renewed conversations about what's important within the budget that, we, that you may have already passed or that you certainly have already put into place. Um, we um, have, as you will remember, um, a month or so ago, we had a um, really important um, guidance um, from you, from the commission, on what should we do, given um, some scenarios for our revenue projections. Uh, and you really said, we want you to use the more most conservative of the options that we presented. And that drove a lot of our decision-making process. As we've gotten more data in, um, and we've reported to you, it has not been as bad as it, it could have been in the scenario. So that has been an advantage for us, but we still are in a very conservative posture, even understanding that we've gotten a little bit better um, data, especially on sales tax than what we had kind of scenario planned. Um, but nevertheless, it is down con uh, qu considerably, uh, as Jeremy will go through in a minute, for the current fiscal year, which also then uh, leads us into the next fiscal year, which we are all also projecting to be uh, lower than this, uh, the previous year. Um, and finally, I would say um, we, we recognize and we hear um, the uh, national um, and local uh, calls for reconsideration, reimagination. The commission has uh, asked us to start conversations about 
uh, about policing and criminal justice and social justice in our in our community and in the nation. And um, so, while this budget doesn't make significant changes really on any of the services that we're providing, we recognize that those conversations are ahead. And I believe that this proposal gives um, latitude and leaves options open for us to consider those and all other services and priorities. So um, we, we wanted to make sure we recognize that that's happened, but within a 30-day time frame uh, to uh, make this recommendation, uh, it would have been uh, too much and, and inappropriate, uh, in my opinion, to uh, try to go through that process without listening and without understanding where we need to go. So this is a total expenditure budget of $291 million. Um, I want to talk about things that are not as interesting to the most citizens, but they are have a, a big impact, and you will recognize them, I think, as you go through the budget. Um, but we have um, the city was already on the path to use uh, to charge services uh, central services off to departments of the consumers or the beneficiaries of those services. The reason uh, high performing organizations use those um, types of things is, is so that you can have a conversation, you can understand a unit of service um, provided to a citizen or consumed by a citizen. It, this is a full cost. If we hid those costs or we didn't allocate costs um, that, that were part of that service cost, uh, the overhead, if you will, then you really wouldn't be talking about what is the real cost of doing this or, or, or building a project or providing a service. We wouldn't have those full loaded costs, if you will. It's really important for full transparency. It's also important for us when we're having priority-based budgeting that we know that loaded cost, that it completes the cost of service. And it helps change also um, the conversations that we have as we as we look to lead and manage and make decisions uh, in the operations of the organization, which I think are important and useful. Um, the second piece is um, that we consolidated several funds. Um, and let me go back to that other one. I, this also creates, however, that you're going to see some expenditures lines that are transfers uh, that are um, make it look like the costs have grown from a year-to-year -year basis, and that is only that we're charging off services that weren't charged anywhere before. So um, I think it is an appropriate thing for us to have good conversations. We needed to uh, do the remainder of the program to charge these services off, which this should be, This most of it is done in the second year, this year of the program, but it does, it does create an appearance that some budgets have grown, departmental budgets have grown, when in fact, they're only um, paying a cost that was uh, located someplace else in the budget previously. The second consider, uh, major uh, change, and this is the type of thing that we need to do only once or only infrequently because um, it, it, it can mess up our trend analysis, um, and that is the consolidation of several funds. So um, we'll, when we go through here, they'll be highlighted to you, but it was important in my first budget, um, and as Jeremy and I talked about it, we're making these changes that are very difficult to do, even in a really difficult budget process, but I asked them to step up and go in ahead and do these things because next year and the year after and the year after, we will have apples to apples trend comparison, and that's gonna be very important with the, the work that we have ahead uh, with our community. So we did consolidate several funds, and the theory behind this, the reason why this is important is that uh, I believe that the um, conversations that we most tend to have in cities and the commissions do are not as much on the revenue side as they are on the expenditure side. So we have most of our decisions are, and you'll see it through this budget process I expect, are about how much are we spend in here, how much are we spend in there, can we spend less, can we spend more, what are we getting done, the expenditure side. The revenue side for most governments in most cities is not very uh, dynamic. And we get our the source of our revenue from just a handful of revenue sources, and pretty much once they're set, they're set, and we understand what those are, and there isn't much we can do to control those. Um, so what this does is, is say we're going to park all of our expenditure stuff in the general fund so we can, we can have those critical conversations that we like to have, but we can know where all of our resources are and all of our expenditures are. If you have special funds, 
um, and you're talking about I'm going to spend some mowing money in this fund and some mowing money in this fund and some mowing money in this fund, that doesn't give you all the time a clear picture of, well, how much are we spending a month? And so we're charging things off um, just from where the revenue was received, and I don't think that that's very useful. And so by making this change, we are going to reset kind of what our, our trend analysis will be going forward, but I think you'll find it to be a much more useful and less confusing process, and thus the transparency to the community and the participants, as well as you as users and decision makers in trying to do um, what is a very a difficult job on a $291 million budget. So that's the reason why those are important for us to do. Uh, and finally, um, we have separated out our capital improvement plan to the capital improvement uh, um, projects, which are more traditional of what you'd see. I'd say more or less the capital improvement plan are the big investments that have a long, useful life. And we have a definition for those. And um, a month or two ago, we went through those with you and, and had a good conversation about those. The maintenance plan um, is this, the projects that are important for us to do and that have longer than a one-year life, but they don't have a 20-year life such that you could sell uh, bonds against them, typically. And finally, the vehicle and equipment replacement. These are um, si similar behaviors, but we can manage our fleet and some of our major equipment replacement um, that is a predictable cycle, but we have a fund established so that those can be managed so for lowest cost of ownership. So those are the kind of the big kind of behind the scenes highlights that are important and they, they have real, really large implications on our total budget that you'll see as we go through the budget, um, but they aren't necessarily um, talking about prioritization as much, which um, is where um, most of our conversations are usually spent. I'm going to turn it over to Jeremy now and he's going to take it uh, through the revenue. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, before we get started tonight, as uh, Craig mentioned, uh, this is his first budget with the city. This is my second budget with the city, but uh, this is probably the most unique budget I've ever been a part of in my 20 year career. Um, and you'll see a lot of the reasons why uh, as we as we continue through. Jeremy, uh, now he's gonna take it uh, through the rep. I'm hearing an echo. Thank you very much, Craig. Um, before we get started tonight, uh, sorry about that so um as uh craig mentioned we're really focusing our budget on three uh, main pots of uh, money if you will the general operations of the city will be in the general fund uh, with a lot of transfers uh, going into that fund for the first time the uh, capital plan with the exception of the water and the sewer fund will be in the capital improvement plan with a lot of transfers uh, from other funds going into that fund to support it. And the uh, maintenance plan is essentially funded out of the general fund and the water and sewer fund with a lot of transfers uh, going back and forth for that as well. So um, before we really get into the fund by fund analysis, I thought we'd go over some of our revenue assumptions, uh, what has essentially changed since the last time we uh, presented to you all uh, about 60 days ago. As you know, in the last uh, 60 days, we've received our first two uh, sales tax reports that would have a um, COVID impact. And um, so you'll see some of our revenue uh, analysis that have changed as a result of that. But uh, the first thing we wanna talk about is our property tax. The uh, mill levy that's being proposed for the uh, recommended budget is a flat mill levy with the understanding that the assessed valuation grew 4.3%. So. As you can see from this chart, the city has uh, experienced um, anywhere from three to 5% on average growth in assessed valuation over the last uh, several years. And the uh, variance from the 2019 assessed valuation to the 2020 assessed valuation is a 4.3% increase. Danielle, if you'd like to move on. In terms of sales tax, uh, the last time we spoke, we really thought sales tax would be about 25% less than what we had experienced in 2019. Based on the first two months of our COVID experience, we're now projecting that to be about 85% less. So um, we've seen some significant increases that we hadn't originally anticipated. 
Uh, we knew groceries would be higher than uh, the average. We didn't anticipate it as high as it has been. So that's helped to shore up some of the losses from that we've experienced on the retail side, the restaurant side, and the uh, bar industry side. Um, we also anticipated uh, some increases in revenue on our use tax, which would be um, people who online shop, uh, but it, it has exceeded our uh, estimations as well. So those two areas really helped us to um, feel comfortable increasing our sales tax estimate through the end of this fiscal year with about a 15% loss over 2019 instead of a 25% loss. Um, for 2021, we did not feel that we had enough data to support a flat budget with 2020. So uh, we're starting essentially our, our recommended budget process at a 95%, if you will, of what the adopted budget was for 2020. So there is growth beyond 2020. Uh, we're not what I would consider to be equal with where we thought we would be in 2020. So that's still a loss from that perspective, but it's certainly a, a better outcome or better outlook into the future for 2021 than what we're anticipating for 2020 the rest of the year. In terms of the uh, general fund, we're, um, you all had given us the leeway to uh, dip as low as 15% of um, expenditures for a fund balance total. And in 2020, we're gonna be around 19% of what we anticipate expenditures to be. But in 2021, we're gonna start that process of trying to rebuild the fund balance, because as you all know, we have about a five-year window to get back to 25%. So um, the plan before you tonight anticipates that by the end of 2021, we would be at 21% fund balance, so about 4% off our target. Obviously, we'll continue to closely monitor revenues and expenses throughout this year and 2021 and uh, make any necessary adjustments uh, quarterly, as Craig had mentioned. In terms of 2020, the um, anticipated expenses that uh, were um, not in our original budget plan for 2020, uh, the only um, significant one for the general fund would be payouts for fire, medical, police overtime um, that we had not originally anticipated. However, we do believe that we have significant um, savings within the budget to absorb that. So we, uh, we don't anticipate that that would be a uh, undue burden um, on the taxpayer. And um, at this time, I'd just like to say uh, all of the departments really uh, stepped up when Craig asked them to, uh, you know, really tighten their belt and, and help us um, winnow our expectations for 2020 and even winnow our expectations for 2021. Um, and those adjustments that were made at the department level that you'll hear about uh, later on in the presentation are really what we believe is helping us to get over this um, uh, hopefully short-term financial uh, hurdle of the, of the COVID crisis. Danielle, you can move on to the next slide. So this slide here is an overview of the entire general fund. Um, I won't go you know, line by line, uh, but just wanna highlight a few areas. The uh, Douglas County Build Services, that's, what the, that's the county's portion of the EMS service that we provide to the entire county. Um, so when the fire and medical department budget is uh, presented to the county, it's not a you know one-for-one -one relationship, but they pay essentially about 24 to 25% of the entire budget for the, um, for the fire EMS department. And so the revenue increase that you see from 2020 to 2021 is an, uh, ex or is an understanding of the expense increase that the fire and medical department is seeing as well. As you can see from uh, the unaudited numbers in 2019 on fines and forfeitures, um, our original budget estimate, even pre-COVID, was probably a little too high for 2020. And so in the 2020 revision process, we've taken time to analyze uh, where the fines and forfeitures have been historically uh, and understand that with uh, the COVID crisis um, and the um, 
reduced hours at the court, that those revenues would be reduced as well. And so we've made those adjustments in both 2020 and 2021, recognizing the historical trend of where uh, the fines and forfeitures have been over the last several years. We also did that with uh, licensing and permitting. Again, we had, um, based on what we had seen in 2018, we had written the budget in 2020 at just over uh, $2.1 million. Um, obviously, building permits have, have slowed, and so we've revised that number for both uh, 2020 and 2021 based on uh, conversations with the planning department. Part of the difference in what you see in the 2021 estimate, however, are uh, permits that were um, collected by the city clerk and those revenues are now showing up in the internal service fund. So that's not necessarily a cut, it's just a move of where they're being recorded. Um, on the expense side, that's sort of what you're seeing as well. Um, as Craig mentioned, we had started an internal service fund last year that uh, focused on the uh, human resources department, the finance department, the information technology department, and the risk management department. Those were charges that historically had been charged 100% to the general fund, even though utilities and other funds within the city benefited from those shared services. And so we began that process last year. The goal in 2021 was to uh, remove the rest of the administration from being a sole burden of the general fund and a shared burden of all the funds within the city. And so the, the city commission has been moved to internal service fund the city manager, the uh, public information officer, the, uh, the city attorney, but not municipal court, has been moved uh, to the internal service fund as well. And um, we're also beginning the process of uh, itemizing building maintenance and making that a shared internal service, though currently it's uh, pretty much a uh, general fund dominated department. So even though it's in the internal service fund, a large portion of that is being charged back to the, to the general fund. And that's what you can see the, um, there is an increase in personnel. Um, part of that increase, as uh, Craig indicated, we had folded in the rec, uh, the recreation fund and the golf course fund into the general fund. But then we also pulled out those shared services. So. The combination of all that is the difference between personnel in 2020 and the personnel in 2021. Uh, the internal service fund, as you can see, going from 3.3 million to uh, almost 8.4 million is the recognition of the general funds portion of those shared services. The rest of uh, that decrease from the general fund is being split amongst the utilities and other operating funds within the city. I believe that's all I have uh, to report on that page. Thank you. So this chart here, um, you'll see for every fund with the exception of the bond and interest fund, we wanted to put together a chart that sort of gave a, a little uh, look back, if you will, over the last several years, and then a look forward to uh, what we're seeing right now through the pandemic. As you can see in the general fund, revenues and expenses have pretty much been uh, very tightly aligned with the exception of 2020 as we're going to experience a dip in that revenue. And so fund balance has essentially stayed uh, right in that 25% uh, realm as well. And so the dip you see from 2019 to 2020 is what we had discussed previously. And then the, there's a slight increase as we realign revenues and expenditures in 2021 and begin to put a little bit of that money back into the fund balance. Moving on to the capital improvement reserve fund. This fund is uh, going to tra uh, transition, if you will, from where the city has historically held the capital reserve and will focus only on the capital sales tax moving forward. The capital reserve will now uh, be uh, in the capital improvement fund. So what you're seeing uh, historically in this fund are grants that are um, sought by the city for road projects or park projects or any other uh, capital project and um, miscellaneous reimbursements from say the county or other partners that may uh, cost share with us on, on projects and all of those funds now are going to uh, be diverted to the capital improvement fund which you'll see in a few slides 
And so this fund now is just going to house that 0.3 sales tax. And what you'll see moving forward from 2021 and beyond is really just a transfer of that sales tax to either the CIP fund or the general fund to cover the expenses that are allowed uh, under the, under the uh, voter's intent. The small amount of money that remains in contractual services is really just to pay for the investment fees of our investment broker. So we'll show you this chart. So you can see the expenses um, are uh, quite a bit higher in 2021. That's us moving the capital reserve out of that fund. Um, the revenues and the fund balances uh, are all uh, in a, in a uh, decline because we're only going to capture the sales tax in this fund moving forward. And so what you'll see on this chart in beginning in 2022 and moving forward is a real tight alignment of revenues and expenses, much like you saw in the general fund. The equipment reserve fund is uh, not going to change names, but it's, uh, it's uh, going to be the vehicle and equipment replacement fund. And so what you'll see here are transfers from the general fund, uh, the stormwater fund, the solid waste fund, any of those funds that have equipment that needs to be replaced, those will all be transferred here. Um, and then the, you'll see those expenditures in the vehicle and equipment replacement um, plan that will align to the amount of money that you see in the annual budget here. Um, the only difference between this fund um, outside of that vehicle and equipment replacement plan is there's a set court fee for uh, court technology and that, re that will reside in this fund. Uh, it's required to be separated by statute. And so you can see um, at the bottom, we have that reserve for municipal court. So a component of fund balance will always be that reserve balance that won't be for the vehicle and equipment replacement plan of the city. It will only be for the municipal court per the state statute. And so this is a, uh, this is a chart again, uh, as you've seen historically, revenues and expenses have sort of teeter tottered based on uh, what we needed at the time. But uh, this fund will also have a tight alignment between revenue and expenses going forward. And the fund balance will predominantly be solely for um, the uh, municipal court moving forward. The guest tax fund candidly is probably the fund that I have the least confidence in because um, the information that we're receiving from the state uh, anecdotally throughout the, the nation is, is very conflicting. Um, we're, I feel pretty good about the 850 that we anticipate uh, we'll receive uh, in 2020. Quite honestly, the 1.6 is really a hope that we go back to the Lawrence we all know and love. Um, but if we do not, then this is one of the funds that will probably uh, experience significant uh, budget adjustments throughout the year. Um, and that's really just predicated on the fact that, um, you know, as we come out of this pandemic and hope that we don't either stagnate where we currently are or, or conditions get worse and we have to sh uh, hunker down again, that sporting events uh, will start to occur and we'll see traveling teams coming to Lawrence as we've uh, known in the past, that we'll see people uh, coming and staying in hotels for events throughout town, th uh, for KU, et cetera. And there's just real no indication on the horizon right now that would lead us to think uh, one way or the other. And so as Craig has mentioned, this is a placeholder budget. Um, we wanted to be very uh, honest in our estimate that, um, you know, this is more of a, a recognition that um, should things go back to normal, this is what we anticipate. But if they do not, this is one of the budgets that we're going to have to closely watch and make sure that our expenditures uh, stay in alignment with our revenues. So going to the next slide, um, I'm sorry, Danielle, could you go back uh, real quick? Um, one of the things I forgot to mention off the top, I apologize, that as Craig mentioned, uh, we're really trying to um, get our budget as streamlined as possible. And one of the things that we did this year that's a little different than what the city has done historically is we wanted to make sure that every employee in the city is really housed out of one place. 
And then if that employee is shared against multiple functions that may uh, be funded from a different funding source, that those revenues just simply be transferred to that home fund, if you will, um, rather than split that employee by paycheck as we have done historically. We feel like that's a more um, consistent way to handle the, uh, the situation. It also provides the city more flexibility in terms of how to uh, um, deploy our resources so that we're not, we're not held to a strict 20% of the time of the employee A has to be spent on this activity. It could be 20% of the entire workforce spends their time on this activity, um, which is a much easier thing for managers to uh, make sure we stay in alignment with. So the personnel services that are being reduced in this uh, fund are really being changed to that transfer line. So if you just imagine, instead of paying for the personnel out of the guest tax fund, we're transferring this money to the general fund where those employees are housed. Uh, to help cover the cost of essentially downtown maintenance um, and maintenance of the downtown corridor. So the personnel services that reside in this fund are really just for uh, specific part-time people that will only be doing uh, the functions here and not a shared service. And so as you look at this chart, um, you can see our expenditures have exceeded revenues uh, every year since 2015 and fund balance has gone down accordingly. There was a adjustment, a restatement, if you will, of fund balance in 2017 that sort of reset that bar. But as you can see, 18 to 19 went down, 19 to 20 is going down. We're projecting 20 to 21 to go down as well. And that's why this is a fund that we really need to make sure, uh, especially in 2022 and moving beyond, that we tightly align revenue and expenditures and uh, make sure that we are um, preserving the guest tax fund for the future uh, benefit of the residents of Lawrence. The library fund is also a mill levy fund. Um, we are currently not requesting a mill levy increase, though I do believe the, the library board may be discussing requesting a possible mill levy increase. I'm not sure if that'll be done uh, this evening or if that'll be done at the um, at your next meeting. Uh, but we have had sort of preliminary conversations with them that uh, they may they may need to ask for a, a mill levy increase. But at the time this budget was put together, one was not contemplated. So really the only difference between uh, the mill levy revenue and the expenditure, as you can see in uh, 2019, more revenue was, <clears throat> excuse me, more uh, revenue was, um, brought in, or more revenue in 2018, excuse me, was brought in than in 2019 originally anticipated. And that's where the fund balance came from. Uh, in discussions with the library, they had asked that we'd add that to their 2021 budget. So that's what we are recommending. Um, as we discussed, I believe last year, this is gonna be one of those things where if uh, vehicle taxes come in a little higher than we anticipated or delinquent taxes come in a little higher than we anticipated, um, our two options are to either amend the current year budget, but we really won't know that until late, late in the year, um, or just add it to the next fiscal year. And uh, so that's traditionally what the city has done with the library, as you'll see on the next chart. Revenues and expenses are tightly aligned and fund balance is essentially flat. The transportation sales tax has the same uh, percentage changes that were discussed in the general fund. Um, the only real difference to note it for transportation would be the uh, charges, fees for services. Based on what we're experiencing, um, we anticipate a, a rather significant drop in revenue um, for the remainder of the fiscal year and uh, don't really anticipate that to change much into 2021. As you know, we received a federal grant. Those uh, grant dollars are not recorded in the sales tax fund, they're recorded in the grant fund. Um, but that grant has been a, a real uh, blessing for the city and uh, will help us to uh, purchase some electric buses that uh, I think will help us toward our goal uh, to march toward a, a uh, more sustainable uh, bus fleet. And will also help the uh, operations of this department. Um, but what we will need to uh, make sure we continue to monitor is that our expenses for the transit system stay within that sales tax, uh, you know, save any grants that they're able to find. <clears throat> the um, 
significant change that you see here uh, because we are transferring the uh, capital projects to the capital project fund and vehicle and equipment to the vehicle and equipment fund you see a large transfer out of here three and a half million of that is for the uh, multimodal facility that's been discussed for a few years and the remainder of that is for um, essentially a grant match toward those uh, buses So this is a chart where you see the um, fund balance has been growing for quite a while. As um, I'm sure most will remember, the city had two sales taxes that went towards transit for quite a while. Uh, the, the 0.2 cent sales tax that uh, is on a 10-year sunset, and there was also a 0 0.05 sales tax. Uh, so those two funds combined are, have been housed here. Um, under this new plan, we're moving part of that 0 0.05 fund balance out for the multimodal facility. Um, but the uh, the main uh, expenses that are left here are just for the operation of the transit system. The next fund is the recreation fund. Uh, as uh, Craig indicated, we are moving this uh, both revenue and expenses to the general fund. Um, as you can see, our estimation is that to uh, sort of end this fund with a zero balance, we'll have to increase the subsidy from the general fund as we discussed about uh, 60 days ago, the last time we discussed the budget. So uh, that increase is shown under the operating transfer in the 2020 revised budget. And then the chart, you can see the expense uh, stayed on a pretty steady path the revenues, if you exclude the transfer from the general fund, would show a pretty significant decline, which was uh, the main driver for uh, moving these expenses to the general fund, excuse me, to be with the rest of the parks uh, expenses for the city. This next slide is an amalgamation of all the other special revenue funds we have. Uh, in the interest of time, we really didn't wanna go through uh, 54 funds um, the majority of these, as you can see, based on the revenues, are, are really small funds that have just a single purpose use. Uh, if people are interested in that, all of this information is uh, on our OpenGov site, and uh, you're more than welcome to go out there. But we wanted to just uh, provide all the other special revenue funds at an uh, aggregate level. This would be the, um, the gasoline tax from the state and the county, the special alcohol tax, and the special recreation tax which are two thirds of the liquor tax from the state. Um, the, um, the housing assistance sales tax, the 0 0.05 sales tax is included in here as well. Um, and so as you can see, we uh, we're just trying to make sure that we keep our revenues and our expenditures in line with those trans Jeremy, this is Mayor Nutt. I think we lost you. Can you hear me? Now we can hear you. Yes. Hmm. I don't know what happened. Sorry about that. It happens. How far? Well, you got you got very loud right as you were switching slides. So I think if you want to stop at the, start at the top of um, or at the end of that slide, I think. Um, should be okay. okay. This is Jeremy Wilmoth, the finance director. Um, the uh, slide that you have before you is an amalgamation of all the uh, other special revenue funds that we have in the city. There's 54 funds in, in total, and we just didn't think that it would be uh, very beneficial to the public uh, or our time here tonight to go through each and every slide when most of these funds are a general purpose or a specific purpose special revenue fund such as the gasoline tax from the state and the county, the uh, special liquor tax and the special recreation fund that are two thirds of the liquor tax from the state of Kansas, the uh, housing assistance sales tax. And so this slide here is really just uh, showing all of them together, but um, I'm not sure if you've heard me say this or not. Uh, if anyone would like to see each and every uh, fund, they're all out on our open source, uh, open gov website. Um, but for purposes of our presentation tonight, we just wanted to provide them in the aggregate. 
and this would show you the uh, combined revenues and expenses for all of those funds. Um, like all of the, uh, or as Craig mentioned before, as we're moving all these funds to the general fund, we're seeing one-time transfers from the special sales, uh, special gasoline sales tax, the uh, special recreation fund, the special alcohol fund. Uh, so that's why you're seeing fund balance uh, winnow in those funds as we're transferring those funds to the appropriate places to fund the capital improvement plan, the maintenance plan, or the vehicle and equipment replacement plan. This is the one fund that we really wanted to go a lot farther out so that we could explain um, the CIP plan. Um, and so, as you can see, the fund balance in the bond and interest fund is um, projected to be a little over, or just right around $12.5 million at the end of 2020. And so, um, one of the things that Craig charged us with was trying to figure out a way to fund the, the capital improvement plan. Uh, Daniel, if you want to move to the next slide. So what, what we did was we took uh, essentially what we anticipate it would cost to issue $20 million a year for the next five years and uh, recognizing that it won't be in even increments. You know, some years it may be 18 million, some years it may be 22 million, but on the average, it'll be around 20 million over the next five years. And so as you can see, uh, the expenses climbing the orange line from 2022 through 2027, and then starting to decline, that's when other uh, um, general obligation bonds that the city is currently paying start to uh, roll off. And so um, projecting a very modest 1% revenue growth in the uh, bond and interest mill levy, uh, we feel very confident that we can support the current uh, five-year CIP as it's been, as it will be presented tonight. Um, and as you can see, fund balance will uh, start to decline as those expenses go up. And then by 2028, uh, expenses will drop below revenue again, and you'll start to see the fund balance go up again. Now, this is not to say that, you know, we won't be issuing debt beyond the five years. This is really just to show you that we can afford within our current mill levy structure as it's uh, contemplated right now, the five-year growth to uh, fund the CIP. And then in 2028 or 2029, we could begin issuing debt again without seeing an increase in the mill levy. Moving on to the capital project fund. This is the first year that we've really um, highlighted this fund as part of the, as part of the budget process. Historically, this fund has really just been the place where um, bonded projects have been housed. So um, as you'll see when we get to the next slide, not yet, but when we get there, um, revenues and expenses have never really been aligned because a lot of the projects get started. And then after we have a pretty good idea of what they're going to cost, that's when the debt is issued. Um, so there's been quite a few times throughout the history of this fund where um, it's had a negative fund balance waiting for those bonds to be issued for project costs that have already been incurred. Um, but looking at where we are right now, uh, as you all know, we issued some significant debt in uh, 2019. That's the 43.5 million that you see listed there. The primary um, temporary note that was issued was for the new police facility. Um, we had about $13.9 million in expenditures. So our current fund balance is projected to be right at 31.4 million. Uh, based on the CIP that's being presented tonight, we anticipate we'll issue $8.4 million of, uh, I'm sorry, based on the CIP that was issued last year, we anticipate uh, $8.4 million being issued uh, in 2020. Our expenses are targeted at uh, about 16.6, which leaves us with a fund balance of about $23.1 million. Um, that $23.1 is all spoken for with projects that you've already approved. They just haven't gone through uh, the entire pipeline yet. So beginning in 2021, um, this is really where you're going to see what uh, we used to um, house in the capital improvement reserve fund. So uh, grants that we're anticipating on receiving the 4.9 million are to uh, help support the capital improvement plan. The 13.9 million is uh, the bonds that we anticipate issuing to support the capital improvement plan. And the 17.1 million are transfers from other places within the organization, again, to support the capital improvement plan. 
So as you can see, the revenues have sort of ebbed and flowed based on debt issuances, but moving forward, we're really going to see a tight alignment between revenues and expenses, uh, and fund balance will be a product of uh, going down just as those bond projects get uh, funded, contracted, and then uh, expensed. Moving on to the utility, the water and wastewater fund, uh, this assumes an 8% rate increase, which um, I think most people remember the uh, rate model uh, that was put into place several years ago had uh, anticipated that 8% rate increase. Um, I would say that a large portion of the maintenance plan that's being funded is uh, due in, in large part to this rate increase. So should the city not issue an 8% rate increase or to whatever extent the city does not issue an 8% rate increase, we would have to back out uh, those expenses from the maintenance plan. Um, or future debt issues, which ties to the CIP or the maintenance plan. So uh, those are the revenue estimates that you see um, based on that 8% increase. And then the, um, the increase in internal services, as I indicated earlier, is that recognition of all the other shared services um, from the city being charged out uh, based on our allocation methodology. The debt service is increasing based on uh, this fund issuing debt as well in 2021. And then the transfers, uh, about 3 million of that is going to their capital project fund that is uh, funding the non-bonded portion of the CIP. And the rest of that is going to the general fund as a uh, pilot payment for um, what would be considered a franchise fee if we weren't a government. Sorry, could you go back? Um, I took an untimed breath there, sorry. The, uh, what I wanted to show here is the debt service reserve is what's required under the uh, revenue bond uh, uh, obligations. Um, we're anticipating that that new revenue bond requirement will be 18.5 based on the debt that they're planning to issue in 2021, leaving available for uh, use for the capital plan or the maintenance plan, the 14.2 million so the total fund balance in this fund is 32.8 million. And that's what you'll see on the next slide. Revenues and expenses in uh, this fund again are tightly aligned and the fund balance um, is gonna you know, hover somewhere between uh, 18 million and above based on uh, funding that they need for the, the maintenance plan and the capital improvement plan. Solid waste is assuming a 3% rate increase based on the uh, rate model that they're currently working on. Um, again, the internal service funds are increasing based on uh, the, those shared costs that we discussed earlier. And the transfers out, um, the majority of this is being transferred to the CIP to help pay for a portion of the planned uh, shared facility for the MSO and uh, the rest of that is for uh, vehicle and equipment um, per the, the vehicle and equipment plan that we'll, we'll discuss here in a few minutes. So again, you're seeing the, uh, this fund I believe has been storing money uh, or reserving money, if you will, for the last several years, knowing that they were going to have to make some sort of facility move um, whether that was improvements to the facility they're currently in or the shared service plant uh, facility that is now being contemplated. And so what you're seeing in 2021 is that money being moved out uh, for the CIP to fund that project. And then all the other minor uh, enterprise funds, it's really just the stormwater fund and the parking fund now. In 2019, it was the stormwater fund, the parking fund, and the golf course fund, actually 19 and 20. Uh, but with the golf course fund moving to the general fund, it's really just the stormwater fund and the parking fund. So uh, the charges for services uh, are anticipating an, uh, an increase in stormwater fees, uh, as you'll see in the uh, capital plan and also the maintenance plan. Those are for um, projects that have, uh, I believe staff believes have been needed to be done for quite some time. There just hasn't been adequate revenue. And so the ask is that the revenue be adjusted commensurate to help uh, offset those costs for uh, deferred stormwater maintenance projects. 
as you see from this slide in the, the combination, um, revenues have exceeded uh, expenditures pre predominantly in the uh, stormwater fund. The parking fund has been uh, much closer aligned and the, the golf course fund is actually uh, not seen an increase in revenue over expenses for quite some time, which is why we're recommending moving that to the general fund as just a, a general operation of the, of the city. So the, um, the increase in expenses over revenues in 2021 is again, uh, moving those, those dollars to the, either the capital improvement plan or the maintenance plan or the vehicle equipment replacement plan. And then the internal service fund, um, this also is uh, the first time that we've really presented the internal, internal service funds at an aggregate level. Um, in the past, you've seen either the central maintenance garage as an internal service fund, or last year we showed the central maintenance garage and the um, new administrative services fund. Um, but we wanted to show the entire portfolio, if you will, of internal service funds. So we have risk management funds that predominantly are for workers' comp, uh, compensation insurance. Um, we have um, a uh, risk reserve fund for um, general liability claims for the city. And we have a health insurance fund um, for the health care of all the employees of the city. And then we have the administrative services fund that uh, covers all of those shared administrative services that we've already talked about, as well as the garage. And so the, the, um, the increase in 2021 over 2020 is the recognition of those shared services being moved from the general fund uh, to be shared across the, the entire organization. And that's what you see here, a, a tight alignment to revenue and expenses as the revenues in this fund come from all of the operating funds, um, which are charged out on a, on a um, allocation basis. There'll be a slight um, fund balance increase in this fund as uh, we're sort of building up a reserve, if you will, in the workers' comp fund that we haven't had for a, a few years. And we want to maintain that reserve that we currently have in the health insurance fund as the, the city is self-insured. Um, we do have uh, an umbrella policy that, you know, sort of uh, protects us from a catastrophic uh, health care claim, but all other claims are funded by the city. And so keeping a, uh, a healthy reserve for health care cost is uh, a very wise and prudent investment. So, um, Mayor Ananda, I don't know if you want to pause here and uh, talk about the fund pages or if you'd like me to keep going and uh, talk about the capital improvement plan. I think that we can bring that question to the commissioners as to what their preference is. Um, I know we have a lot of information to get through. I also know that we probably have some questions. So if, if you want to ask them now, feel free to do so. Or if you would rather wait until we're finished, we also have public comment on this item. Um, whatever you all prefer. Preference? Hearing no preference, perhaps we'll let Jeremy just continue on and um, We'll stop at the next section and check in again. Thank you, Jeremy. Very good, thank you. Jeremy Wilmoth, Finance Director for the City. <clears throat> As we discussed um, at our first meeting talking about the CIP, the uh, Capital Improvement Plan is really our long-term planning tool to look at uh, the assets that are owned by the city and what it will take to either improve those assets to maintain their life for a longer period of time uh, add new assets to the city that will have to be maintained uh, into perpetuity. Um, but the, the, the main um, impetus of the capital improvement plan is that uh, anything we fund out of here really needs to have a useful life greater than two years and needs to cost more than $100,000. And if it meets those two thresholds, then we capitalize that cost, meaning we essentially pay for a portion of it every year over the life of the asset. Uh, before we get into the, the capital plan, I just want to remind everyone that a detail sheet on every single capital plan that you'll see tonight is listed on our website under our budget uh, CIP section of, of, uh, of our website. So the, um, the last time we presented this uh, document to you, we really just looked at 
all of the projects and we hadn't really uh, been able to, to discern funded from unfunded in a, a meaningful way. And so tonight we're presenting the CIP again with the funded portion and the unfunded portion. And uh, we're happy to say that based on uh, where our current um, capacity for uh, debt issuance is, based on um, the uh, utilities, um, presuming the rate increases uh, per the rate model, we believe that we can fund 240 million of the $254 million capital improvement plan. For purposes of tonight though, we're just gonna focus on 2021. So the uh, projects we're gonna discuss now are the 51.6 million uh, that are funded and they're listed by highest uh, scoring uh, down to the lowest scoring. So um, the highest scored project in our capital plan is the stormwater system identification assessment and uh, model creation of, of that uh, system. And I think uh, sort of as we mentioned in the uh, a few slides ago about the stormwater fund, I think everybody knows that um, the city really needs to come up with a comprehensive um, forward thinking model for stormwater maintenance and uh, stormwater improvements. And so uh, this project is one that um, was highly scored as being a very critical need for the organization. The next highest is the Americans uh, with Disabilities Act ramp improvements. Um, it also scored very highly uh, based on the critical nature of making sure that we have a accessibility, uh, accessible community for all of our residents and all of our guests. The next highest project was extending the 27th Street extension. Um, as you all read in the paper, we received a grant for the majority of this. And so um, the difference between what the grant covers is uh, what's being transferred from the capital sales tax to cover uh, the cost of this project. The uh, next highest scored project is the 17th Street in Alabama drainage improvement. So this will be funded through the stormwater um, util utility fee the asset management program is sort of being split between the general fund and the utility funds, um, but this is a comprehensive asset management program uh, for the city that will help us better align um, the dollars that we have identified with uh, the assets that we currently have, um, help us to really get an understanding of what our maintenance costs should be uh, annually going forward so that as we continue to hone and fine tune this budget, uh, we'll have numbers that um, are clearly represented uh, as maintenance for all of the various assets within the, the uh, city. The 9th Street in Mississippi is um, the next highest project. The uh, project after that, the WWTP stands for the wastewater treatment plant. So the Kansas River wastewater treatment plant. These are improvements to that plant and uh, nutrient removal um, which is required by the uh, permits that are issued by the state of Kansas. The next highest scored project is that multimodal facility that we've discussed uh, that's being funded out of the transportation sales tax. Um, one of the things that um, I know MSO will be discussing with you is the uh, farmland property, also known as Venture Park. Um, the remediation that's required uh, under our state agreement for that property. Um, we've got that anticipated at 1.5 million uh, next year. The uh, next one is this um, stormwater uh, conveyance corridor improvements. These again are projects that are being funded out of the stormwater utility fee. Um, the next project is a New York Street 24 inch transmission water main line. Uh, this is being funded out of the water in the wastewater fund. The CDBG infrastructure improvements are funded by a grant, um, but those will also be in the CIP. The next project is 23rd Street from uh, the Haskell Bridge to the city limits. This project also has a, a grant uh, attached to it, but these are the total costs that are shown here. The uh, 19th Street reconstruction from Harper to O'Connell that was discussed uh, is the next highest scored project. The next project after that is Wakarusa from Research Parkway to 23rd Street. After that is the Clinton Water Treatment Plant. 
uh, piping project and that field operation study that I mentioned earlier uh, that's being funded by the water wastewater fund a portion will be funded by the general fund a portion is being funded by the solid waste fund the stormwater fund um, that's the funding that you see here for that project the um, the city's airport has a terminal uh, building rehab and um, Americans for Disability Act improvements that are needed. The uh, next project is actually a, um, a project that um, really helps our green initiative. Instead of using um, fresh, uh, fresh water, we're uh, working on a irrigation system that would allow uh, gray water to be used at both the sports complex and the uh, golf course. Um, that will save um, the taxpayers money over time um, from the difference in cost of the production of that water. The next uh, highest score project is the sidewalk and the bike and pedestrian improvements plan. The next highest score project is the uh, pump station number 16, which is an uh, interceptor rehabilitation plan. And a few more projects here, the Lawrence Loop Trail. This is design uh, money that's set aside for the Lawrence Loop from Peterson Road to the hospital. The uh, next plan uh, is the Burroughs Creek Trail extension. And uh, the next plan is the private lateral and sewer extension. It's a cost sharing plan between the city and res uh, customers. The um, next plan is the green pavement intersection uh, plan this is really extending the green pavement that you see around town into a few more intersections to help uh, both motorists and bicyclists to know uh, where the safe route uh, for bicyclists are. And then the last funded plan is the Wakarusa wastewater treatment plan, um, their maintenance building improvements to that. So the total funded uh, CIP is 51.6 million. Moving on to the vehicle equipment replacement plan, we have uh, $14 million identified um, and the, we'll go through those projects uh, briefly. The, um, these are listed from the, uh, the highest cost to the lowest cost, just to provide some context. The transit vehicles that we discussed from the federal grant is in the, the vehicle equipment plan uh, we have a fire truck replacement number five in the plan. We also have fire medical radios that are funded in the plan. Um, solid waste has a smart truck program that they'd like to roll out. We have funding set aside for the human resources uh, department to uh, create an information uh, system. The annual police vehicle replacement plan. Uh, this is not 100% funded, but uh, this is the money that's uh, been uh, allocated for that as well as a record management system for the police department. All of the other vehicles uh, for the city, we uh, set aside around $400,000 a year for that. Uh, the Municipal Services and Operations Department has a backhoe uh, on the replacement plan. The finance system that we've talked about previously, um, our uh, enterprise-wide finance system is in the plan. Solid Waste has several vehicles. Uh, this one is an automated side loader. There's a couple of side loaders and a front loader. Um, there's also some roll off containers in Solid Waste, a sewer jet truck. Uh, we have money set aside in the plan for um, fiber uh, installation projects with information technology. Parks and Recreation has a tractor with a boom mower. Um, there's a road chipper truck. Uh, municipal services and operations as a tractor that's in the plan. The city clerk also has a records management system for the entire organization in the plan. Uh, we also have a virtual memory hardware replacement uh, scheduled in the plan for the information technology department and then a, uh, a rollback truck. So the, the total of all the funded projects uh, in the vehicle and equipment replacement plan is just over $14 million. And lastly, we want to talk about the maintenance plan. This is the one where uh, as we see revenues improve uh, in future years, you can see we have a significant unfunded burden uh, in our maintenance plan. And um, that, that's an area that we're going to need to address moving forward to make sure that our roads 
and uh, the rest of our infrastructure stay at a level that our citizens expect it to be. Uh, but what we did fund in 2021 is 24.4 million. This one too is listed from the uh, highest uh, maintenance project to the lowest. Our highest uh, maintenance project that's funded is 6.5 million. There is a portion of this that's unfunded as well, but uh, we were able to fund 6.5 million in our, our recommended budget. Uh, the, sanitar the sanitary sewer uh, rapid I and I uh, inflow and infiltration reduction program is an annual program we do to help reduce um, stormwater and other uh, water uh, entering into the sanitary sewer system, causing uh, um, possible flooding issues. Is in the plan. The um, water uh, department also has the Clinton storage tanks uh, in the plan water main replacement and uh, stormwater line replacements are in the plan. We have an alley rehabilitation program that's in the plan, uh, a traffic signal rehabilitation program that's in our uh, currently funded in our plan. And then there's water treatment plant improvements, both the Con Clinton. Uh, while it's a large number in aggregate, these are really smaller items uh, throughout the plan. So they don't add to the total value of the plant, but there are maintenance projects that need to be done, as well as the wastewater treatment plants as well. The facility maintenance program is for all the other facilities that aren't utility related within the city, uh, predominantly um, park, uh, parks and recreation buildings, uh, city hall, uh, riverfront, things like that. Our current curb and gutter replacement program is uh, funded in the plan. The sewer maintenance, the sewer main, excuse me, re relocation program is in the plan. The uh, sidewalk improvement program, both the public assistance and the property owned by the city is in our plan. A taxiway rehabilitation at the airport is in the plan. The, uh, a stormwater quality program is being added to the plan. And then several park improvements are uh, funded in our current plan as well as uh, utility pump station maintenance. Again, these aren't capital improvements, but they're just maintenance projects throughout all the various pump stations within our uh, system. We have accessibility improvements to help um, all of our residents to uh, have um, accessibility within, within our community. There's uh, recreation center improvements, again, not capital, um, at the at the micro level um, just maintaining our current assets what we have we also have a uh, plan to replace some of the downtown pavers um, we've been i believe this is the uh, we skipped a year but this is essentially year four of a four-year plan and then parking lot maintenance uh, for the various parking lots downtown uh, sidewalk sidewalk hazard repair is a little different than the other one this is for uh, critical needs that pop up on city owned property. The stormwater pump maintenance plan is uh, much like the water and wastewater maintenance plan, just maintaining those pumps um, throughout the year. And then finally the levy maintenance, making sure that the levy is maintained, um, you know, mowed properly and uh, making any repairs as needed to the levy. So the total funded maintenance plan is 24.4 million. The next section of the budget we want to talk about is uh, personnel. Um, as uh, you know, we've had a, a pay plan at the city for a while. The, um, the city really tries to make sure that the pay plan is equitable between the um, employees that are a part of a, a bargaining unit or a, a collective um, plan and the employees that are not. Um, and so our compensation plan is recommending a slight general wage adjustment, a um, market adjustment to remain competitive, and also the steps that are uh, contractually agreed to with um, both of the employment groups. The total compensation recommendation uh, for the 2021 budget is just over 1.4 million. And as you can see, the equity that's uh, in our plan um, is about $1,700 per uh, employee in the plan for the primary pay plan and the police pay plan and $1,400 in the uh, firefighters pay plan. 
we don't have a slide on this uh, tonight, but as you'll recall in years past, the firefighters had uh, received um, a little larger uh, increase in those other pay plans. And so while this one doesn't appear to be as equitable when you look at it over the course of the last several years, there really is pretty good parity between the three plans. And so to break out those uh, plans, the Lawrence Police Officers Association, uh, the step increase is just over uh, $109,000. The general wage adjustment would be an additional 117,000 for a total of uh, just under 227,000. For the firefighters, the step increases is 117,000. The general wage adjustment would be uh, around 62,000 for a total of 179,000. And then the primary plan, which would be all the employees that aren't in those two plans, the general wage adjustment is 210,000. The uh, market adjustments, it's really trying to make sure that uh, we address compression issues within our current pay plan is just over 827,000 for a total of a little over a million dollars. And that's the 1.4 million we showed you on the last slide. In terms of benefits, um, we felt pretty good about where healthcare plan was in terms of its funding capacity right now. And so the city is not re recommending an increase either to the amount of money that we contribute for healthcare or the amount of money that the employees contribute. Um, we feel pretty good that we can go a year um, given all the other uncertainties that are going on right now and, uh, and that that fund would stay in, in good shape. The state retirement plans uh, communicated to us that the amount of uh, money for the police and fire pension will be 22.8% of wages and the amount for all the other employees will be 9.87%. Those are not percentages that we set. Those are percentages that are set by capers and uh, just told to us. And then probably the, the biggest significant change um, in terms of funding, excuse me, historically the city has budgeted salaries and benefits at 100%. Um, and we've really seen that, uh, whether it's due to turnover or whether it's due to um, other things within the organization, there's been a, a, a gap, if you will, between what we had planned to spend and what we actually spent. And so that money sort of sat around as a, uh, a year end um, bonus isn't the right word, but a year end um, transfer. And historically, we've transferred that to both the capital and the vehicle and equipment replacement plan. In this year's budget, we're actually uh, budgeting expenses at 97% so that we can afford to make those transfers on the front end of the budget as part of our plan rather than the back end as an afterthought. So. Um, this is our first year doing this. Based on what I've seen historically, I think the 97% the globally should be uh, achievable. Obviously, there'll be departments, smaller departments that don't have that turnover that will need to make adjustments, uh, as Craig mentioned, on the quarterly basis. Um, but globally, we feel pretty confident that we can maintain this level of funding and uh, provide that difference at, uh, to help support the, the capital plan, the maintenance plan, and the vehicle and equipment replacement plan. And so we have just a few personnel adjustments. Um, the uh, transit and parking department is adding a transportation planner that's going to serve as grant writer. The uh, public information uh, office is adding an administrative assistant to help with communications um, citywide the, uh, the Municipal Services and Operations Department is adding uh, two specialists and an analyst into the stormwater function to uh, help, as we had indicated, as they start to get that data, help to process that data and make sure that we're uh, making intelligent decisions that are strategic uh, in addressing our stormwater uh, program moving forward. And so the next section I'd like to talk about is the impact to the taxpayer. This slide here shows the mill levies uh, for the state of Kansas, both school districts, the county and the city. As you can see, the uh, city's levy is the purple line with the uh, asterisk on it. The levy has been essentially flat over the last several years. Um, 
so we're uh, we're maintaining that level of spending uh, for the for the resident. For those who like to look at the picture a little differently, here's uh, a dollar bill. So if you consider every dollar of property tax that's paid by a resident um, of uh, Douglas County, um, one percent of that dollar would go toward the state of Kansas. Uh, Thirty-nine percent would go to the school districts. Thirty-four percent would go to the county, and twenty-five percent would go to the city, based on current levies. And then, as we discussed a little bit uh, earlier, the estimated increase for water and wastewater of eight percent would be roughly a seventy-six percent increase to the average family. The solid waste increase of 3% would be roughly 7%, though that rate model is still being finalized. And so um, it may not impact every level of the customer base equally. Um, and then the stormwater increase would be around $27 annually. And so when you stack all of those up, the property tax, uh, the solid waste, the stormwater, and the water and uh, sewer, this is um, what that chart has looked like over the last several years. Moving on to the outside agencies that are funded in this uh, budget. Social service uh, funding is being recommended at a flat level with 2020. The general fund is at 749,000 and the special alcohol fund is at 756,000. The economic development agencies are also uh, recommended at a flat level, and uh, that that amount is seven hundred thousand. The Lawrence Douglas County Health Department is at seven hundred and fifty-eight thousand. While this is a slight reduction, it was uh, presented to us by the county as a reduction in the health care costs uh, that they anticipate for that department. So, from an operational standpoint, it's really a flat budget. Uh, but there is a slight decline in uh, health care. Explore Lawrence is equal with the 2020 adopted budget of 996,000, and there's 70,000 currently set aside in the guest tax fund for other organizations uh, that the city commission would like to support. Now with that, I'm gonna turn it over to Danielle, unless you'd like to uh, stop here and, and ask any questions. This is Mayor Ananda. Does anybody have any questions before we kind of jump into the next piece of this presentation? No? Just okay. Stuart, Commissioner yeah. Bowley, I have a few questions. Mm -hmm. um, um, I actually have a lot of questions, but I'm not sure there we have time to fit them all in. Um, I guess I'd like to go back to kind of the beginning and where we talked about I think it was Craig talked about um, how the changes are being made to how we do our funds and the internal service funds. And I, my question I kind of say is that over the last several years, we've had a lot of changes to how we do things with our budgeting and also with, with how we account for things. And Is this going to be pretty much the way that you want to see things going forward um, so that you'll have those apples to apples comparisons you talked about? Uh, one being, do you think that this is where we're going to be with the internal service funds? And two, do you think that the, the funds that are in the 2020, 2021 budget will be essentially the same funds over the next several years? This is Craig Owen, city manager. Thanks for the question. Uh, Jeremy may want to follow up with a little more detail after I, uh, after I respond. I, it is, and uh, it, as I said, um, it is the way I'd like to see them presented going forward. Um, and uh, it was hard, it was a hard ask to make considering all of the complexity that we were already considering uh, uh, that our finance and budget team was, was doing, but um, they agreed with me, I, I think. Uh, because we did it, uh, but um, I, I think the um, the value going forward of the transparency and to kind of understand the total cost of deliverables, uh, the, of what what the, the taxpayer receives, 
is worth it. And it is something that um, we had to do now so that we're not having multiple changes uh, going forward over the course of uh, the several years I hope to be here, and I think Jeremy uh, joins me in that hope. So we did make the decision to make some of those modifications. The internal service um, fund charges, um, I, I, I were already started. I mean, so this is really, I think, the second year, a substantial year of doing that. And while I think Jeremy referenced a couple others that we'd like to get to, um, overall, we think that we made the big chunks um, have been satisfied now so we may and including information that you may uh, give us and some direction we may get from the commission may do a few more but for the most part i think the big steps have been taken uh, last year and this year this is great. thank you um, the next question i have is um, it's my understanding that the uh, maintenance plan and the uh, vehicle and equipment replacement plans are going to be cash funded rather than bond funded. Is that accurate? This is Jeremy Wilmoth, uh, finance director. So there will be some pieces of equipment in the vehicle and equipment replacement plan that will be bond funded, uh, predominantly fire trucks, as they're a large capital asset that lasts uh, 10 to 15 years. Um, the goal is to get to a place where we're setting aside enough money on an annualized basis that all of the equipment can be replaced uh, from cash reserves built up over time. So in other words, um, let's say a, a fire truck costs 1.2 million, we would set aside 120,000 a year and then year 10, we would have 1.2 million to go buy that uh, fire truck with cash. That is the goal. We certainly cannot get there in one year. So um, there will be some vehicle leases, there will be some short term uh, funding strategies to help bridge that gap, uh, but we are committed uh, to the plan. And um, as I had uh, sort of alluded to, as we see revenues start to rebound, the the area that staff would really like to focus on is making sure that we have adequate funding for the vehicle and equipment replacement plan moving forward, and also the maintenance plan. Thank you, this is Commissioner Bulligan. If, if we could take a look at the general fund slide that shows the details of the general fund, please. That's slide 19. I'm sorry, that's of the... Sorry, my, this is Danielle Bush, kind of Budget and Strategic Initiatives Administrator. My screen is currently frozen, so give me just one minute and I'll get, I'll get everyone there, so I apologize. Mr. Willie, is this the slide you're referencing? Yes, um, this is the, the slide that I wanted to visit about. Um, you know, there's a significant increase in both the revenues and the expenditures. And I guess my question is, how much of that is due to the consolidation of the funds that are newly included in the general fund? And how much of it is uh, due to something else? Jeremy Willen, finance director. So it's kind of a, a challenging uh, question to answer from a percentage standpoint, but I'd point you toward the operating transfer that is uh, contemplated at 17.5 million versus last year, uh, 3.8 million. And that is um, a large amount of that transfer that we're discussing. So funds from the um, Special gasoline tax are in that amount. Funds from the special recreation fund are in that amount. Um, other uh, large increases, if you look at charges for services, 
historically they've been less than a million dollars. It's now over five million. The difference between um, what's been done historically and what's recommended in 2021 are those revenues from the recreation fund and the golf course fund. This is Commissioner Bully. Will we see these transfers in future years from these other funds or will they simply be reflected as revenues up above? Jeremy Wilmoth, Finance Department, uh, Finance Director. So uh, statutorily, we're required to record those revenues in a special revenue fund, and they'll be transferred out of that fund and then transferred into either the general fund, the capital improvement plan, the vehicle and equipment replacement plan. So um, they will be transferred in one of those three areas. And um, as uh, city manager um, had said earlier, as we, as we continue down this course, I think everyone will get more comfortable with this process. And then historically, we'll be able to see those trend lines um, I would indicate that because we do have large balances in the special gas uh, fun, uh, gasoline fund, um, the special recreation fund, and um, um, the capital uh, sales tax fund, that the transfer into the general fund and the transfer into uh, the vehicle and equipment replacement fund are larger this year than we'll see as we go forward because those revenues will then be winnowed back to just what we're receiving in any given year from the state uh, or those taxes, uh, those liquor taxes or those gasoline taxes. And so the transfer in um, in future years will decline, which means also the expenses toward maintenance will need to be funded uh, from another source if those revenues aren't available. This is Commissioner Bowling. So essentially what you're saying is these uh, special um, revenue funds will continue to exist. They'll just have a very tight line between revenues and expenditures. The revenues will come in and they'll be transferred to the general fund. Jeremy Which Wilmot. Kind of what we do with the library right now with the property tax funding for the library. Jeremy Wilmot, finance director, that is correct. Okay. Uh, speaking of the library, um, it's news to me that they're considering a, a tax increase as we have said that we are not interested in a property tax increase this year. Um, what is the um, unused capacity in the ordinance um, for them to, uh, to raise? They're at a certain level and, and the ordinance is um, capped. Jeremy Will, Finance Director. Danielle, do you know that offhand? If not, we'll have to get, get that answer and get it back to you. Uh, Danielle Bershkota, Budget and Strategic Initiatives Administrator. The cap is 4.5 mils. Um, there is language in there about that last 0.5 mils um, that I would like to have the ordinance in front of me before I really get into, but uh, the cap in general is that 4.5 mils. And what is the current mill? For the library, I'm pointing that up. Sorry, Jeremy, will the finance director, just one second. The current mill is 4.04. 4.04. So you think that there may be an effective limitation on that last half mill that we need to find out about? Jeremy Wilmot, Finance Director. Yes, as I, I had mentioned, um, our early discussions with the library, um, they had indicated that they weren't going to request an increase. And so we began this presentation uh, sort of with that understanding. And it was only in the last week that they indicated that uh, the board may be interested in adding staff. Um, I don't really want to speak uh, okay. too far into that because that, that's really their uh, decision to make and no decision to my knowledge has been made as of yet. Um, but so we will do the research to figure out what uh, capacity they certainly they currently have under uh, the current ordinance for the library. Okay, I'd appreciate learning more about that. Thank you. This is Commissioner Bowley again. Um, if we can go to the 2020 water and wastewater slide, please. It's the waste water wastewater detail slide.
this commission building. This is, that's the correct slide. Um, the debt service that we have adopted is 19 and roughly a half million dollars. The 2020 revised budget is 16. Uh, can you explain why the debt service that we're actually paying is less than the adopted budget? It would seem to me that those would be very tightly aligned. Chairman Willen, Finance Director, yes. Um, so the, I believe when the 2020 bu budget was being considered, uh, the, <clears throat> excuse me, the uh, Municipal Services and Operations Department had contemplated uh, issuing more debt in uh, discussing with them their current debt capacity. Uh, we felt that there wasn't a need to issue that debt in 2020 and instead move that to 2021. This Commissioner Bullock, thank you very much for the answers to those questions. I certainly appreciate it. Commissioner Larson here, I got a question for Jeremy. On um, the uh, Fund Overview Equipment Reserve Fund, which is page 23 of 164. Could you explain the um, reserve for the municipal court? I know you mentioned it, and could you explain why that has to come out of that equipment reserve fund or why that's part of that fund? Reserve? Yes, if, Jeremy Wellman, finance director. If you look at the line called fines, forfeitures, and penalties mm -hmm. in 2019, that amount was $55,244. The budget yeah. for 2020 and 2021 is 65,000. Do you see that line? Yes. That is a a direct fee that's mandated by the state to be charged for equipment and technology upgrades for the municipal court. So it's part of the court cost that's carved out specifically for that purpose. So the revenue is recorded here, the reserve is recorded here, and any expenses would be recorded here as well. Okay. Okay. So the um, if you look at operating transfers, where um, this uh, 2021, you're looking at 10 million dollars versus 460,000 in 2020. You indicated that that was from the various departments' um, vehicle costs. Is that correct? Yes, that's correct. Okay. All right. Thank you. Sorry, Jeremy Wilman, finance director. Yes, that's correct. This is Vice Mayor Finkelberg. Jeremy, a couple questions. Um, looking at the general fund, the question I had on, you know, the three big things I think about are property tax, sales tax, and franchise fees. And historically, that was our three biggest income sources. So property tax is up a little bit, 300,000 or so. Sales tax is down 1.5 million. Franchise fees are down uh, 258000 So that those three big funds are down 2021 over 2020, about $1.4 million. But, of course, the budget itself actually shows a surplus. Is some of that one-time fee, one-time money coming over from some of those transfers? Or, again, my mind would go that those big funds are down our general fund should be down. So I'm just trying to walk through the the logic there. Yes. Yeah, so um, I, I think it, the Jeremy Wallen finance director, I think it's really um, what you compare it to. So um, property tax would be down compared to um, what we had um, a, well, I'm sorry, property tax would be uh, 350, 7,000 higher than what we originally anticipated for 2020. Uh, we are uh, pessimistically anticipating a reduction, um, not in value, but in collections uh, based on the current recession that we're seeing. Um, so if that doesn't uh, occur, and we should know by, um, I believe, November, whether or not that uh, reduction would occur, then as um, Craig had mentioned earlier, part of our revised budget maybe to, to ratchet that back up because, again, it's not based on valuation that we believe property taxes are going to be less than originally anticipated. It's based on um, collectability. And so um, when you compare the uh, 2021 property tax to the 2020 revised budget, 
it's about a $783,000 increase for property taxes. Um, again, trying to um, read the tea leaves, if you will, on uh, collectability into the future. Um, in terms of property, or I'm sorry, sales taxes, we're uh, projecting a rather significant reduction in 2020. And we wanted to show that we believe 2021 will be better. Um, we, we, based on our current data model, don't think that we'll be um, anywhere close to what we would normally anticipate, which is about a 2% growth year over year. Um, but what we're, what, what we're um, optimistically hoping for is that by the end of 2021, we've essentially gotten back to uh, where we would have been had COVID never occurred if you consider it that way. Um, so it's just a, a, a slight decrease of where we would have been at the end of 2020. Essentially it took us two years to, build, to bridge that gap rather than um, traditionally the city has seen about a 2% growth year over year in, in sales tax. Uh, we're, we're projecting a, a significant decline in sales tax in 2020, as you can see on our chart and then 2021 is the hope that we sort of get back to um, whatever the new normal is. This is and Vice Mayor Finkel. I guess my question was maybe broader. If you had told me going into the budget that property taxes would be up just a little bit and sales taxes would be down a lot and franchise fees would be down quite a bit, I would have expected to see our general fund spending go down. Instead, we have general fund spending in a surplus, so we're actually putting some in. I guess I'm trying to kind of big picture, because it's hard to, to compare year over year because of these changes. I mean, where is it that we're making that up? Jeremy Wall, the finance director. So, um, I, I, yeah, I, I understand the, the challenge here. Um, the amount of money that was pulled out of the general fund in shared services and moved to the internal service fund is larger than the amount of money that was added to the budget for um, recreation and golf. And so the revenues that came in with recreation and golf, they did not cover 100% of the expense, but they, they pretty, they came very close uh, to covering what we've seen uh, historically. So while the, you see that on the expense side, you also see it on the revenue side through our charges for services. This is so the rest of the general fund is able to absorb this, um, the impact of COVID, if you will, based on the fact that the administrative charges or the administrative expenses have been moved to the internal service fund. This is uh, Daniel Bush Cutter Budget and Strategic Initiatives Administrator. And one, one thing I want to add as well that I think is hard to see with some of the changes is um, we really pushed the departments in 2020 revised to find savings um, in their budgets, acknowledging that, you know, travel may be down. We're seeing a decrease in gas prices and, and some of those kind of one time things that we can reduce temporarily. Um, so you'll see the difference between our 2020 adopted budget on the expense side and the 2020 revised budget on the expense side going down. And that's helping make up some of that gap as well. And we not only asked departments to do that in 2020, we also asked them to really do that in 2021 as well. Um, so I think that's a part of it too, that because we're adding in all those other funds, because we're, we're making the change to with the internal service function that gets lost a little bit, but one of the things that is also helping kind of fill that gap um, that, we're, that we're seeing here in the general fund, but it's hard to see in that year over year picture. This is Vice Mayor Finkeldye. So Danielle, if I'm hearing you right, you're saying there's some cost savings in 2020 that will carry over to 2021, as well as that 3% um, of salary reduction. Those are two things that are showing up. Um, it's hard to see in these big pictures, but showing up overall. Is that what you're saying? This is Danielle Bush, Cutter Budget and Strategic Initiatives Administrator. Yes, that is correct. Vice Mayor Finkel, I thank you. That does actually help a lot. Um, second, I guess, question, 
you know, we're basically going from an $80 million general fund to a $95 million general fund. Um, and a lot, some of it has to do with these internal transfers. Some of it has to be with adding the rec fund in. Is 25% reserve still the right goal based upon the $95 million? Um, you know, we certainly didn't have that sort of reserve in the rec fund. Um, is there any reason with these new changes to reconsider what our goal is on reserve funds? Jeremy Wallen, finance director. So um, I, I understand uh, the sentiment, but um, the whole idea behind the reserve is for an emergency purpose. And so even though the pie is getting larger, the ability to fund uh, a downturn in the economy doesn't change at all. So proportionately that 25% uh, is still an adequate number because we're, we've essentially added 25% of that increase into what we need to reserve moving forward to, main, to uh, maintain an adequate reserve uh, for emergency purposes. Um, as we'll, uh, as finance staff will bring back to you later this year, we're, uh, we're going to request a, um, a fund balance policy for the remainder of the, the city funds that have a significant operational impact. Uh, we don't believe that 25% will be in all of them, but um, the, the parks and recreation department, if you will, um, whether it was in the park fund or um, the park and a recreation fund and a golf course fund, um, in the event that we had a downturn, as we did see this year, you're seeing that the general fund operating transfer to support that activity went up. And so having that capacity within the reserve is the only reason we were able to do that. This is Vice Mayor Finkel, I thank you. And I hoped and thought that would be your answer, but I wanted to ask. And related to uh, reserve funds, you know, we're talking about an 8% increase in the water wastewater and they have a, a hefty reserve fund, not only the 18 million, but I think another 14 million or so. Um, I think a natural question would be with that large of a reserve, why are we raising rates? Jeremy Wilmot, finance director. And um, as the MSO presents their budget or, or as, as that budget is presented tonight, I think, um, they'll be able to, to uh, add to what I'm saying, but the, the debt reserve is actually a reserve that's being held on behalf of the bond holders of those revenue bonds. And so that's not money that's available to the city in any way. It's restricted and reserved in the event the city were un unable to make a debt service payment. The debt reserve is there to cover that debt, essentially to um, uh, underwrite that debt, if you will, to the bondholder to ensure that their investment is secured. Um, so essentially we're showing it here, but it, we, we just have to sort of remove that from our mind as an ability um, to have any access to that money until those bonds are fully repaid. The amount of money that is available for use, the 14.2 million that we're projecting into 2021, um, as you'll see in the um, maintenance plan uh, that's also attached to this presentation and on our website, the uh, there's significant maintenance costs to maintain the water and the sewer infrastructure, whether it be the lines, the mains, the transmission lines, um, the new um, automated metering infrastructure that's being implemented within the city, um, or any of the other myriad functions to maintain that utility. They all have significant price tags on them. And to the extent that we have this money available now, it lessens the impact of future rate increases, if that makes uh, sense. Vice Mayor Finkel, that does. Thank you. The city manager, Craig Owens, before there's another question, I do know that we have um, uh, the library director, Brad Allen, has joined us on the call and I think could respond to the, the question from uh, Commissioner Foley from earlier. This is Brad Allen, Lawrence Public Library Director. Great question, Stuart. Um, let me fill you in a little bit on what, what's going on with our budget. We received um, the numbers from the city last Monday, and they were lower than what we had projected. We had projected a 5.5% increase, and when we built our budget and we had 
created a, we had predicted the same type of delinquency factor when we built our budget. So the numbers came in lower than what we were expecting. That's why we went with the 75,000 carryover that they were going to adopt this year. We pitched that over to 2021 to get us back up to the 4978. And the issue that we're really just trying to decide, I think we have it figured out, but I asked Danielle how we should proceed and the budget needed to be submitted before I had enough time to talk with our board chair, or really anybody. The, the pressure point that we have on our budget right now is, uh, you might recall that we're um, working with the county uh, behavioral health and Burt Nash with uh, peer support fellows. And the year is up on the peer support. And we had said we would do what we could to bring somebody online with us at the end of that fellowship ending, which would which we would start in January 2021. And they want it to be a full time position and are only able to give us a certain amount of money towards it. So that's an and I wasn't expecting a, a full time FTE request from them either. I was thinking it would be more part time. But I figured we could make it work and the due budget numbers are making it difficult to get that new FTE on board. When we look at equity and all the different things that the city is doing, joining GARE, when we look at what we feel like we should do as a library when it comes to how we secure our building and how we work with mental health issues in our community, we feel like this is a really important position. So I'm trying to figure out how to make that happen. I'm hoping I can make it happen within our budget. It's just really tight. So that was the discussion that I had had with Danielle um, and our board is gonna meet on the 20th and they're just gonna discuss it. It's really a, if we can't figure it out, it's a, it's a matter of $28,000 just to be clear on it. So it would be a couple hundreds of a mil increase. We're gonna try to get it done otherwise, but that really just means cutting into other things that we had already budgeted that were pretty tight. I, I, that That's just the straight answer on it. Happy to answer any other questions on it. Mr. Commissioner Bully, Brad, I really appreciate that explanation. And, um, you know, I appreciate the work that the library is doing and the steps that you're taking in that area. My concern is, is that everybody's really struggling right now. We all have to try to make things work. And, and a property tax increase is really not where we wanted to be. We were all pretty, um, you know, on board on that. And I invite my fellow commissioners to, to express their views but you know i think it's really important that we try to work with them what we can in, in property tax and and not raise the rate this is brad allen library director i hear that that's our goal and they're going to discuss and if and if we decide to proceed in that manner we'll we'll bring an argument to the commission to to kind of get your feedback on it i've been rerunning our numbers the, the other thing that i did forget to mention that's tricky also is in addition to this, um, a lot of our other very small amounts of non-tax revenue, we've cut that dramatically by about $60,000, $67,000. We're like, will the Merck be there even through 2021? That rent's not coming in. We're not having meeting room fee collections, prop, or all of our insurance like anybody else's within the MIP investment we're in drop. So, it, it we took hits on both sides just like the city is taking on sales tax so it uh what we we thought we were what we thought we were going to have it's about one hundred twenty five thousand dollars less so i'm trying to figure out how to make this position happen we don't want to raise the mill either and i don't it, i'll say i don't expect us to come with a recommendation for a mill increase um i don't expect that to happen for just for some clarity this is commissioner bulligan and brad i i appreciate that and you know the you, you talk about the sales tax, the city itself has taken a dramatic drop in sales tax revenue. Uh, fortunately for the library, uh, it has, its revenues are much more stable because it's property fund tax, property tax funded exclusively uh, from the city. And so you don't have that problem that we have with the sales tax drop. This is Brad Allen, library director. I'm fully aware of that and the things that the city are having to deal with that frankly we haven't had to and uh anyway i just wanted to explain because i you seem surprised by that and i had a day to turn anything around and so 
they're just telling you what they knew from, you know, I was like, when can I get back to you? And, you know, Danielle's like, this has to go in in an hour and a half. And so, yeah, I didn't really have a whole lot of time. It's too much um, for in all transparency. And that's nobody's, that's nobody's spot. I'm not, that's just the way it is. So I, I've worked a budget here. considerably since then. And I, I don't anticipate a mill increase. I, I'll say that. This is Commissioner Bulligan. Brad, I really want to thank you for being here to, to respond tonight. It's been very useful for me and I really appreciate it. This is Brad uh, Allen, library director. I didn't know how to get onto the Zoom before and I waited till the last minute. So I was just watching on TV. So I, I apologize that I wasn't here early. Um, but uh, thanks Craig for getting me online. I really appreciate it. <laughs> and I just, I didn't want you left with that hanging. So thanks for getting me on here. Happy to answer any other questions. This is Mayor Nanda. Are there other questions from commissioners for Brad or for any of the presentation we've experienced so far? So I'm going to request we've been here for a little over two hours. I would like to take um, a 10 minute recess.
is me, and I think it's been about 10 minutes. Sherry, do I need to do a roll call in a work session when we come back? We're on mute. I think we're muted. I can't, I can't hear you. Uh, yes, it would be good if you could do roll call. Thank you. Sure. Um, Vice Mayor Finkelday? Here. Commissioner Larson? Here. Commissioner Bully? Here. Commissioner Shipley? And I am Mayor Ananda. We are all present and accounted for. So I think we were ready for the next step in our presentation. Um, I will go. This is Danielle Bushcutter, Budget and Strategic Initiatives Administrator. Um, we will jump on in to the department presentations. There we go. Um, and just a couple things I kind of want to note um, on the front end of this is. Um, really that I'm going to be providing a very high level overview. Um, I'm going to do my best not to repeat the information that uh, we have already talked about today. Um, so you may see me kind of skipping through some of these slides relatively quickly, but um, really hoping at the end um, that you all can really ask the questions that you want to of uh, the various departments. They obviously know much more about their uh, individual budgets than I do, um, and I know they would be more than happy to answer uh, the questions that you all have. Uh, and we really hope that this format will really let you all drive the discussion um, and really get the answers to those questions uh, that you all are looking for. So with that, we're going to touch a little bit um, on the internal mm -hmm. service fund, uh, just because this is still um, a little bit new for us, um, and really focus on um, the fact that an internal service fund is really um, just to account for um, the true cost of providing services um, and really to make sure that we account for all of the functions um, that we have internally that support our kind of external facing operations. Um, so again, just noting all of the functions that are being included in the 2021 budget that are listed below. Um, so those first four, human resources, information technology, risk management, and finance are all functions that were included in the 2020 budget. Um, and then we have expanded it to also include the attorney's office, city manager, commission, public information, city clerk, um, and facility maintenance. I do think it's important when we say this that uh, we also talk about what is not included. Um, so when we talk about um, the city attorney's office being an internal service fund, function. Um, we are not talking about municipal court. We're not talking about human relations. Those will stay in the general fund where they have always been. We're really just talking about um, that city attorney office function. Same thing related to the city manager. There are a number of divisions within the city manager's office um, that are not included in the internal service fund, particularly transit and parking and economic development. So just want to make sure uh, that we were clear about what is included and, and what is not being included. Um, so the only thing that I really want to highlight from this slide, because we've covered most of it already, um, is that when we are looking at our internal service funds, um, the costing methodology that we use is going to continually be evaluated um, as we um, have more experience with these. So we have already updated the costing methodology for information technology and for human resources. Um, to try to get a better alignment between um, those departments that are heavy users of those functions versus the ones that are not. So um, we feel really good about the functions we have in our internal service fund, but we will continue to kind of tweak that costing methodology as we learn more um, as we move through this um, in future years. Um, so here, really, I, I just want to focus on those kind of key goals and objectives. and. Um, I know we've mentioned it before, but I do think it bears repeating um, that we really are excited to get our new strategic plan um, adopted and, and in place so we can start um, really moving towards that priority based budgeting uh, that we um, started last year um, and we can really start uh, talking about the budget in some of those other ways. And a couple of the other things um, that are worth noting here too um, is that um, IT is, is also working on some uh, centralization centric um, functions um, and really aligning the budget um, with those functions. So one of the things that we'll see in the next slide is um, that we actually took some expenditures that were IT related from all of the various operating departments and put them into um, the internal service fund so that IT can really manage 
uh, those contracts that we have with different vendors and things like that um, instead of it, it being decentralized. So really centralizing those functions um, and implementing uh, better governance related to um, IT um, across the entire city so that, that we have some consistency. So this is gonna be one that I don't think any of you um, are gonna be too surprised to see. There's a significant increase. Um, it went from about a $10 million budget to 17. I will note we did pull out, um, excuse me, the healthcare fund from this. We're just talking about those internal service functions related that, that we just mentioned. So th this doesn't include healthcare and the, the chart that Jeremy presented earlier did, but um, you're seeing a, a significant increase really related to all those additional functions and those changes in the IT budget that we talked about, um, pulling costs out of departmental budgets and centralizing it into the IT budget. Um, I wanna talk a little bit about um, parking and transit because those are um, functions of um, divisions within the city manager's office. So we wanted to make sure that we covered them. Um, we alluded to this a little bit earlier, but some significant changes here really are related to the CARES Act um, to help cover some of those projected operating losses that we're expecting. Um, and that electric bus um, grant that we received uh, is also being reflected in the charts that we'll look at in just a minute. Um, really, uh, the other key thing here that we haven't really talked about yet um, is that the parking rates um, for the implementation of the new downtown parking system will be um, in effect to January 1 of 2021. So some of the key goals um, and outcomes that uh, parking and public transit are really hoping to achieve in the upcoming year are making progress on the multimodal facility with a, a current target date um, of 2020 or 2023 of getting that facility open. Um, so really hoping to get started on some of that work uh, here in 2021. And then um, also related to that is planning, analyzing, and then actually procuring uh, the electric buses. Um, and then just starting uh, that bus stop amenity improvement program as well. So we've had funding identified for this. So really um, making good progress in that regard. Um, and then as, as we noted earlier, um, an additional position is being uh, proposed um, so the idea is that um, we're able to get more state and federal uh, grant funding um, than what that position is going to cost us. So that it's a, a net positive um, in terms of funding. So uh, a goal is uh, to meet that um, balance as well. And then obviously implementing those new parking technologies downtown so that we can be a little bit more uh, customer friendly um, with our pay stations and, and payment options. Um, so as you can see, um, this public transit budget has really ebbed and flowed um, over the last several years. And the key driver in this is really that capital outlay. So what you're seeing here is that multimodal facility, um, those uh, electric buses, um, and really those capital projects um, that are, that are going to be underway in 2021 uh, related to our public transit system. Um, parking. Um, I wanted to include, um, because I think it's, it's um, important that we show kind of both sides of this, uh, the key driver here is really um, in those contractual services, um, and this is related to um, the contractor that we're using to help implement those um, downtown parking improvements um, and paying them for um, providing that um, system that will be used to actually take those payments and, and process all of that. So that's really the, the key driver in here. Um, those other um, categories are, are staying relatively flat. All right, the next department is planning and development services. Um, so one of the things uh, that they did was point out some of the changes to the 2020 amended budget. Um, and I think this is important because like I mentioned earlier, uh, we did really task departments with looking at what are some um, permanent or more like in, in more cases, temporary reductions that uh, you all can live with for the next um, end of the, the current year. And so um, in doing this, Planning and Development Services was able to reduce their general fund by about 6%. And a lot of that came from leaving uh, vacant positions open um, and not filling those right away. So leaving those open for the remainder of the year. 
The other thing that's um, more on the, the positive side is that uh, you, you will see a number of increased grants for planning and development services um, related to the CARES Act and CDBG and ESG funding uh, that the city has received. And then the final recommendation related um, to the 2020 amended budget is related to the 23rd Street study um, and uh, mm -hmm. requesting that that project be postponed. And we did uh, include a supplemental memo um, with some additional information related to that. Um, as it relates to 2021, there really aren't any significant changes. Um, we did want to note that um, in 2021, um, a fee analysis will be completed. Um, so while there aren't any proposed fee increases recommended for 2021, um, the work will be done and there may be some in 2022. And then finally, the caveat we make every single year and will continue to make is that uh, the grant funds are estimates based on the information we have available um, at this time. Uh, and they, they will very likely change. And so as those change, uh, we will keep you all um, obviously updated on that. But um, those do fluctuate and we find out pretty late in the process uh, what those amounts will actually be. So their key goals for the upcoming year are really related um, to customer service and efficiency improvements. Um, and so that can, um, hope, and so the goal is uh, to have website and other improvements uh, related to marketing and communication, implement an online permitting and payment system, um, and then participate in our uh, financial system software selection process. Um, as with all the other departments, um, as that'll be a, a change that impacts uh, pretty much every department um, uh, pretty significantly. Um, and then also to uh, maintain service level. Um, so here, if we look at these charts, the total budget is uh, about $5.3 million. And like I mentioned before, those fluctuations um, in contractual services are really related to those grants. Um, that we anticipate receiving or have received in 2020 that we do not anticipate receiving again in 2021. All right, moving on uh, to the police department. Um, so the, the budget as proposed does not include um, any significant changes, um, but it, I would be remiss if, if I didn't acknowledge uh, the conversations that will be had about um, policing in our community um, and that those conversations are forthcoming. Um, so we really want to engage the community and do that in a very strategic and, and thoughtful way. And so as changes are uh, presented to you all, recommendations are made, we have our strategic plan in place. Um, we really do have an ability to amend not only this budget, but our entire budget to align with those new priorities um, and to reflect that um, moving forward. So nothing, currently, but, but do want to acknowledge that those conversations are, are coming and, and we have an ability to uh, respond to those um, as we need to. And then um, did want to um, kind of highlight the, the key outcomes and goals. Um, obviously, moving to the new facility is a big one. Um, uh, starting the accreditation process is also one of the things um, that has been identified um, that uh, police start um, working on, as well as um, some work related to restructuring the department and shift deployment evaluation. And then finally establishing uh, some of those long-term uh, facility plan needs. Uh, so those are the, the key goals uh, and outcomes that have been identified so far in 2021. Um, and here is uh, the chart related to police department. So a $28.6 million budget um, you will see that a majority of this is actually coming from those internal service costs. So we do cost those out um, to the police department. You'll see it in the fire department next as well, um, along with all of those enterprise funds. Um, so that's really the key driver. You'll see personnel is actually going down uh, related to how we're now budgeting um, personnel. Uh, but really that internal service fund is uh, the largest impact that uh, the police department is experiencing, everything else is um, staying relatively flat or decreasing. So moving on um, to firemen, um, significant changes relate to um, dissolving the extra board um, program. 
um, and doing a, a staffing replacement plan. Um, they have decreased their uh, training and education funds as well as their facility maintenance funds um, and have suspended their strategic plan um, work. Um, again, noting the personnel changes, uh, you don't necessarily, we didn't necessarily highlight this earlier, but um, no part-time positions uh, for that extra board related to that um, staffing plan that um, they have been moving forward with. Key outcomes and goals for fire medical um, is to maintain the, the current response service levels, um, as well as the ISO rating one that they currently have, um, and then maintain uh, the international accredited, accredited status. Um, implement the new uh, portable radios and, and take uh, delivery of the um, uh, apparatus that is in the 2021 budget. Um, and then finally, really collaborate with the Douglas County Emergency Communications Center to reduce the 911 alarm handling times. Um, so again, uh, you can see here that the, again, personnel is going down um, and the, those internal service costs are really um, the key driver um, and, and increasing this, this budget um, pretty significantly. The other items um, here are relatively flat with the exception of those two capital items. When, when fire med purchases things, they tend to be very expensive. Those uh, pieces of fire apparatus um, are, are very expensive. So you're seeing one of those reflected in 2021. Um, all right, so moving on um, to parks and recreation. Um, so significant changes, we've really talked about these, but consolidating the recreation fund, the special recreation and golf course all into the general fund. Um, and uh, with that, uh, we also really task them to look at their, uh, those functions and those budgets and um, have, it, have it be balanced. So as part of that, they have reduced their part-time staffing, which may result in uh, some facility um, hour changes. Um, CIP projects, I'm not going to walk through these. We already walked through most of these. Same thing with the equipment. Um, Want to highlight the proposed fee increases. Um, they will be adjusted with market demands. Um, and really the key goal for Parks and Recreation for this upcoming year is um, to recover recreation programming as well as facility usage to what it was uh, before COVID. All right, so here is um, the uh, chart for Parks and Recreation. Really the key drivers, and, and this is one that is a, is a little bit challenging, um, but that $1.2 million in transfers is um, also being accounted for in the lines above. So it is uh, double counting. Um, so the, the budget is $16.8 million. Um, and the other major driver, as you can see, is capital outlay. It went from $836,000 to about $3.5 million. So um, that is a, a significant increase um, in parks and recreation uh, capital, uh, really related to all of those CIP items we talked about and all of those equipment items that we have also talked about. So most of those other areas are staying relatively flat. Um, that's really the key driver in their uh, increase. All right, and then finally, um, moving to municipal services and operations. And so um, they broke down um, their goals and objectives kind of into seven key areas. Um, so we'll go into each of these in a little bit more uh, detail. So the first one is um, asset management. So this is one of the CIP items that we talked about being funded. Um, but we wanted to go into a little bit more detail because the, the goal is really to get to that lowest cost of ownership based on the desired level of service, uh, the consequence of failure, and the probability of failure. Um, so really what we need to do in order to achieve this is to really identify all of our an inventory of all of our assets and the condition of um, all of those items as well. And that will really allow us to um, have better budget prioritization discussions and and talk about how can we optimize the dollars that we have available and, um, and use those the most effectively that we can um, and really develop some of those, those treatment strategies. So um, we know that we have an increased need for maintenance and the, the current budget, the dollars we've been able to allocate it don't really reflect the need, but we hope that this asset man management system will help us um, provide better data um, and get a better idea of, of the true condition of everything 
uh, so that we can put forth um, a really um, directed plan uh, to maintain the infrastructure that we have. Um, so I think pictures are always really helpful. Um, so this is a damaged valley gutter, um, and um, there is a cost to degradation and a cost to repair, um, but this is something that, uh, this is an example of um, a stormwater improvement that impacts much more than just stormwater. Um, so I think it's really important to acknowledge that um, there is a cost to um, not maintaining some of the infrastructure that we have. Um, and one of the things I also want to highlight on this slide, again, is that stormwater system identification um, that's tied to the, the stormwater fees that you'll get a presentation on later um, that has more detail. But the goal is to really do an invent uh, inventory and assessment of the condition of our stormwater assets and create a, a model um, within three years um, of getting those that program up and running. Um, and if, if we continue to use the resources that we have available, it would take much longer than that. Um, farmland is another um, key area that uh, we want to spend a little bit of time on. So here's a, a photo of uh, that site. And so um, currently a plan is being put in place in terms of recommendations related to um, remediating this site. So there is $1.1 million um, in operations and maintenance related to the site in the 2021 recommended budget, um, as well as $1.5 million towards capital improvements um, that really uh, will hopefully help us um, take meaningful steps forward in terms of getting this facility um, or getting this site cleaned up. Um, so some of that includes installation of new monitoring wells, uh, removing above ground tanks, uh, as well as sewer line modifications and road rehabilitation. Some additional um, information related to farmland. Um, this cleanup will provide efficiencies um, and, and benefits um, and will help us stay in compliance with the environmental requirements um, outlined by KDHE. Um, as well as integrated planning um, uh, with improvements to the Kansas River Wastewater Treatment Plant. Um, and this is also a redevelopment opportunity. This site um, may serve um, as a location for the future MSO facility that we have been talking about. Um, so uh, future phases of uh, the farmland remediation are included in the CIP um, and may take uh, many different forms, but. Um, this is an area that we'll continue to focus on um, in the years to come in terms of how do we get that site remediated properly. All right, so the next item is sustainability. Um, so uh, a couple items to highlight here, and one is uh, maintaining in compliance with our municipal separate storm sewer system stormwater permit, the MS4 uh, permit, um, as well as a number of programs uh, that municipal services and operations um, um, has in place already, such as their fats, oil, and grease program, uh, cross-connection control program, and lead awareness program. Um, and then also wanted to highlight some of the work um, that uh, MSO is doing uh, in relation to the American Water Works Infrastructure Act uh, Risk and Resilience Assessment. Um, so this is work that ha they have actually already started to do in-house and really um, allows utilities to identify their vulnerabilities to potential threats and then evaluate potential improvements. Um, so like I said, some of this work has already begun and they're starting to see some savings uh, related to doing some of this analysis. Um, item number four is ADA compliance. Um, so as we talked a little bit uh, about in um, our maintenance plan and our CAP, there are dollars related to um, ADA and getting some of our um, facilities um, into compliance with that. Um, and so uh, this is really highlighting the need for that um, transition plan for city facilities and services um, and, and our rights of way. And really a, a desire to get ADA compliance um, into um, our future CIP and maintenance projects um, that have an ADA component to it. Um, so that we can include that in the project budget. So this is an example um, of stairs at West 12th in Ohio. 
Uh, moving along to the airport, um, so really highlighting that there's some um, opportunities there that are reflected in the 2021 budget. Um, if you look at the airport budget, we have a number of um, um, maintenance and improvement projects um, that we have identified and new opportunities to coordinate with the Federal Aviation Administration or FAA, fixed space operator or, or FBO and the uh, hangar tenant. Uh, the, the sixth item is the um, operations campus. Um, so the condition and location of um, some of the current uh, facilities are beyond their useful life. Um, some of them lack um, code compliance or um, amenities and, and have some limitations related to space. And we'll show a couple pictures here in just a minute. Um, and some of the rehabilitation that's needed would be um, incredibly costly. Um, we will also, also show a brief overlay here in just a minute um, that some of those facilities are also in a FEMA floodway um, and don't meet current ADA uh, compliance standards. Um, and as I just mentioned, uh, we may have an opportunity to use um, some land over at the farmland site um, for this consolidated um, um, operations campus. Um, so this is a picture of the solid waste um, operations building located at 11th and Haskell. And as you can see, um, it, it, it is in a FEMA um, floodway, uh, which uh, has posed some issues in the past. This is our uh, current fleet maintenance uh, facility. Um, so you can see that with those big fire apparatus, there is not a lot of space um, to actually work on those vehicles. Um, and so it can be, um, it's an additional challenge uh, that those folks are facing while working on our city fleet. And then this is a picture of how closely we have to um, move our trucks in um, if we want to close the doors so that those can be worked on um, at our current existing facility. And then finally, rate models. Uh, we've already talked about this, so I don't want to get into it in any more detail um, tonight. I know we've uh, been presenting for a while now, but uh, we will have presentations on these um, at uh, one of the upcoming budget meetings. Um, so we'll get into a lot more detail with each of these. Um, so really, I just want to highlight that and, and note that, that these are really just kind of those high level overview. Um, and then again, here is the chart related um, to uh, municipal services and operations. Um, so $137.2 uh, million. Um, I will note that again, a major change here is in that capital outlay mm -hmm. line. Uh, we really are changing how, um, again, we're budgeting for those capital projects. So um, you weren't necessarily seeing all of those projects identified to be debt financed. We would show the debt payment, but not necessarily the cash coming in to actually pay for that project on the front end. And you are now seeing that here. So that's really uh, why you're seeing such a large increase um, from $14 million to $41.8 million in that capital outlay line, um, as well as the transfers. So some of that is kind of being double represented, if you will, because you're seeing the transfer out um, of, let's say, uh, solid waste into um, the um, equipment reserve fund, and then you're seeing the actual um, expense of those vehicles as well. So some of it is being double counted, but um, this is really hopefully a, a better representation of um, each of these uh, different functions, excuse me, different functions. Um, so again, um, internal services another, is another one that uh, you see here um, is going up. Um, personnel services is also going up related to those additional FTEs uh, that are in the recommended budget. All right, so I am going to um, kind of wrap this up. That's what we had for the department um, budgets. I know that there are things that um, I have missed that uh, the departments would love to highlight, um, but really our next steps are um, to uh, receive direction from you all as appropriate tonight. We'll come back on the 28th with that maximum expenditure amount. And then again, uh, public hearing on the 11th and then uh, second final reading of the budget ordinance on the 18th. So um, with that, I just want to close um, with ways that the public is able to participate in this process. 
um, and really um, open it up for you all to ask questions um, uh, that, that you may have. Danielle, this is um, Commissioner Larson. Uh, I had a question about the, you said there was going to be a presentation about the um, the 8% increase in the water wastewater um, um, present part of the presentation. Will, will that be done before we do our, for July 28th? This is uh, Danielle Bush, kind of Budget and Strategic Initiatives Administrator. Um, I will let um, MSO talk a little bit about that. Um, I think um, we tentatively had it slated for uh, that meeting on the 28th. Um, so I don't know if somebody from MSO wants to uh, jump in a little bit and give a brief update of where you all are at on those different rate models. Hello, this is Margaret Mahoney, Management Analyst with Municipal Services and Operations. Um, and I just wanted to let you know um, on the rate models, we will be, um, oh shoot, oh yes, I can grab you. Um, we will be uh, looking at the solid waste rate models. Right now we're gonna be uh, looking at some different customer classes and uh, different types of rates to address things that um, have been inequities in the past. So we'll have more information. That one is not, um, the rates aren't ready yet. And I'm actually gonna throw it over to Amber Schultz to comment on the other two. Sure, so Amber Schultz, um, MSO General Manager <clears throat> for Administration. So we, we've, um, in this past year, um, we've actually implemented two new rate studies. We've, we've implemented stormwater and like Maggie said, um, solid waste. Um, previously, we've, we've, we've always had a um, water and wastewater rate study um the solid waste um like maggie said is is coming along uh the stormwater is probably about um 75 percent complete and along with um water and wastewater is probably 75 percent complete and we'll have that ready to present um later this summer commissioner larson do you know when is it going to be before we do the the um vote on the maximum expenditures So what we're presenting is a, is a maximum um, rate for all three enterprise funds. So the, the maximum on the water wastewater would be 8%. Um, the solid waste would be a 50% increase and um, solid waste would be the, the 3% that we're presenting. Okay. So Commissioner Larson, again, when are you gonna present this? Maggie, correct me if I'm wrong, but I believe it's on the the 28th agenda. Okay, so Commissioner Larson again, so it will be before we take a vote on the maximum expenditures. Correct? Uh, yes, Maggie Mahoney, Municipal Services and Operations, that is correct. Okay, thank you. Mayor Nanda, are there any other questions before we open it up for public comment? We have three individuals signed up for public comment on this item. First is Chad Ustal, you have three minutes. Hello, my name is Chad Osdale. I wanted to come in at the beginning of this process of our budget to ask that you honestly consider funding the unrepresented employees merit pool this year. It's not so much that it would be nice to have, it is that we need it. You denied our merit raise last year because we asked for a general wage adjustment. I'm not trying to pay for a second home or a bass boat. I'm trying to be able to afford a $26 roll of hamburger that cost me $13 three months ago. That's almost impossible to make ends meet 
and I'm just assuming that you're gonna not fund our merit pool this year and I'm just here asking you. No, actually I'm here begging you to not deny our merit pool this year. And at the same time, I would like to address the uh, COVID problem and uh, the budget needs to consider increasing the airflow in the buildings in the city needs to uh, look into at least two UVC lights in the air conditioning systems, intake and extake, to at least try to mitigate the danger in the buildings from this virus that we're dealing with. And it will not hurt at all in the future because I'm sure there will be another virus that pops up in the next five years to deal with if this one doesn't come back to hit us again this winter. But it would be nice to prepare for it and find out later we really didn't have to because it's a lot harder to find out later we should have, but we didn't. I appreciate your time. Thank you very much. Senator Nanda, thank you. The next individual we have signed up for public comment on this item is Michael Allman. Please go ahead, you have three minutes. Good evening, Michael Allman with Sustainability Action Network. Uh, first, I wanted to start with thanking the commission uh, for a month ago when I didn't have an opportunity, I didn't have the time to thank the commission for adopting a 100% renewable electricity contract with Evergy um, as a climate protection measure because what I'm addressing tonight in the CIP has to do with climate change. Um, so first of all, thank you for that decision a month ago. Uh, in the United States, according to the Lawrence Livermore Laboratory, the amount of primary energy in the United States, um, the largest amount is by petroleum at 37%. 28% um, of the primary energy is for transportation. So if you're serious about addressing climate disruption, transportation sector is where the greatest amount of fossil fuel emissions occur and where you will have your greatest impact in your protect, climate protection plan. As you probably know, Sustainability Action Network has advocated for bicycle transportation since our inception in 2007, and we continue to do so, and are very grateful to see several bicycle transportation projects on the CEIP tonight. Uh, the first one, which was listed in the priorities, is the green pavement markings for bikeways where they cross intersections. Um, the greatest collision with cyclists in injury and deaths are motor vehicles turning into cyclists. Um, we've identified some 151 conflict points around the city. Uh, we've estimated based on $15 a square foot. That will be determined by the bid how much of these 151 locations you can actually do. But we look forward to that proceeding in the CIP. Uh, the next one is the uh, Nays Naismith um, between 19th and 23rd that we proposed as early as 2017. It's been in the CIP, widening the street into the median four feet so that the travel lanes are no longer 10 feet, but 12 feet, much safer for buses and um, heavy use there, adding a bicycle track on the east side instead of a sidewalk. You might reference that um, MSO has a grant that they can allocate for this project. Right now, they had intended to do a sidewalk on the east side but a bicycle track could just as well use those funds. Uh, I think I need to wrap it up, and I just wanted to point out that Mayor. the bike ped uh, improvement line item, a couple of years ago, I recall, uh, the commission requested staff separate that line item into the individual projects with an individual line item for each project. 
and I would hope that you would do that in this budget. So thank you very much for your time. Mayor Nada, thank you, Michael. The third person that we have signed up for this evening is Stephen Watts. You have three minutes. Is Mr. Watts on the, on the call or is he in person? He should be on the call. At one point he was on the call. I don't see him now. Porter, is there anyone, this is Mayor Nand again, is there anyone present to give public comment? No, Mayor. Okay. Um, we will call one more time for Stephen Watts. Okay. Um, if he comes back on, Porter, while we're still discussing this, we will go ahead and take his public comment, if you would make me aware, if that's possible. I will. Thank you. Um, so we will go ahead and bring it back up to the commission for now. Mayor, Commissioner Shipley, um, this may be a question for Chief Coffey um, regarding their section of the budget. I seem to recall, I don't remember who explained it to me, when we're trying to gear up towards um, getting a new station, which we do, need um often you would build the personnel to build the station first and so i just was a little concerned that this year seems kind of stagnant for you i didn't i didn't know if you had any thoughts about that or if there was discussion between you and and the city manager about that a couple different options to uh pursue related to that but what we've done can you introduce yourself? Oh, I'm sorry. Sean Coffey, Fire Chief. Thank you. Thank you, Mayor. Um, a couple different ways to do that. The option that we chose to pursue is to uh, purchase the land, design the facility, and then build the facility and purchase the fire apparatus with the personnel coming at the time that we're ready to move into the station, saving those personnel costs, which are the ongoing costs of the facility until the time that we're ready to actually open up the station. This is Vice Mayor Finkel. Um, a few questions. Um, first about the pay plan, and I'm not sure who, who would ask, answer these questions, but um, I recall that we did a market adjustment study and that it is, you know, this is before I was on the commission, but I think it was a two or three or maybe five year implementation plan. Can someone remind me what the implementation plan was and what year we are in that process? This is Daniel Bush, got a budget and strategic initiatives administrator. I see Lori on the call. So Lori, uh, would you mind taking that on? Certainly. Lori Carnahan, Human Resources Director. Uh, the report was produced and delivered to the City Commission in February of 2019, and it had a 2019, 20, uh, 21, and um, 22 implementation plan. We have slowed it down just a little bit because of budget constraints, so it could, it could take another year before it's fully implemented in order to get all of the compression taken care of. Um, so at this point in time, we have uh, continued to suspend the merit program uh, as, um, as called for by the consultant until we're able to complete that part or fully fund the entire program. Vice Mayor Finkel, I thank you for reminding me of that. Um, maybe this question's for Porter or someone else. Can we talk a little bit about what the um, public information administrative assistant is going to do is that um are they actually going to be an administrative assistant or is that just a pay sort of scale and are they going to do different work or what what's planned for that position my this is porter arneal director of communications and creative resources uh what i anticipate is is someone that can um sort of fill some of the gaps that we have right now as far as administrative responsibilities, um, you know, part of my tasks relate to the grant programs that I oversee and that type of thing. 
which requires a lot of paperwork tracking and, and that kind of uh, thing that's harder for me to do when I'm trying to look at the big picture as well. So I think it'll be primarily administrative related sort of activities. Uh, certainly with our group, there's always creative opportunities too. Vice Mayor Finkelguy, thank you. I, I do think that'll be a good um, improvement. I mean, you've done a great job, but it's communication is always an important, important aspect of what we do. Um, a couple questions for MSO. The Ninth and Mississippi project. I, I read the project sheet. Sheet. I was just curious. Does that have implications also for like Ohio Street, where we have we've had some flooding too? Does doing the work at Ninth and Mississippi kind of track all the way down the hill there, or would that be a later project? Engineering Program Director Matt Bond. Uh, yeah, that's the the money that you're seeing for Ninth and Mississippi is actually a watershed study for the entire watershed for Jayhawk going all the way from the Kansas River up to Memorial Stadium. So we're looking at that entire watershed. So that study will tell us exactly what needs to be replaced. We'll start from the downstream side and work our way upstream. Vice Mayor Finkel, so that's that entire area. And it looks like we have some pretty significant money set aside in the next two CIPs to, to do that work, is that correct? Matt Bond, Engineering Program Director, that is correct. Okay. Vice Mayor Finkel, another question for MSO, um, actually for solid waste. I was just curious what a smart truck is for solid waste and what does that mean and what will that accomplish? Um, Dave Wagner, director of the MSO. Um, smart truck technology um, will modernize the trucks so we can map their locations, um, track the work with uh, photography potentially. Um, we actually gave it a go last year on a, uh, a beta test and it wasn't successful. So we're teeing that back up to give it another try, um, including vehicle routing and uh, looking for efficiencies on how to track that information, plus additional uh, major amount of data coming out of uh, um, customer service so you can track a truck, you know when your truck's coming, doing a lot of improvements in that area. Vice Mayor Finkel, I thank you. David, also with the, the new MSO building, um, would that be completed in 2021, or do you think it would go into 2022 before it was operational? Uh, Dave Wagner, director of the MSO. I, I would anticipate that we'll do that in phases. Um, we certainly have to do due diligence on the site that uh, the farmland site is going to work there or not. Um, so there's a lot of planning work to, they, to do before we embark on that and uh, decide who goes first, and it will more than likely, I doubt, be completed in that time frame. It'll take a couple of years. Vice Mayor Finkel, that's all I have. Thank you. This is Mayor Nanda. I guess I've had a, a lot of thoughts while we've been going through this, um, largely that I really appreciate all the work that um, staff and the city manager have put into this in such a challenging year. I know that um, this has been an uphill battle every step of the way, and I really appreciate um, you all getting this to us and also acknowledging you know, that this is a time in which we need to be flexible to the extent that we are able through doing updates um, and revisions throughout the year um, this whole next year. Um, I think that I'll just kind of go through the list of things that I've been thinking about as we've been talking about this. I think that as we're talking about utility increases, and I know that we'll continue this conversation, um, I think it makes more essential our um, Roundup program and our opportunity to expand that program because we know the impact that COVID-19 has had on unemployment. Um, so I'm thankful that these two things correlate or um, are happening simultaneously because um, it's needed um, without a rate increase and it will be more essential as we continue to move forward. Um, I think that I share uh, Commissioner Bully's frustration with the internal service funds in, you know, it's just changing and changing, but we're moving towards something. 
and I'm thankful for the continued explanation and um, kind of grounding that in a way that's going to be incredibly useful for us in the long term. Um, I think that um, as we're looking at our strate strategic planning process and reviewing our police functions in our community and increasing other functions in our community, um, we really are striving to balance that urgency, um, I think, that exists around this issue and really avoiding damaging our community um, unintentionally through acting too swiftly and not completely engaging our community. Uh, so again, I appreciate that flexibility with the understanding that there will be amendments as we go through the year on this. I also appreciate that the MSO goals align with a lot of the city's bigger picture goals. And um, I, li I like the way that that was laid out. So I just wanted to, to bring that up as well. Um, and, and to thank you all again for not increasing the taxes and really um, just trying to collaborate to make this process as smooth as possible. I know that this is the beginning of a conversation or maybe the beginning of the middle of our budget conversation this year. Um, but I, I think that um, many of the questions that I've had have been answered and um, this has just been a really, just so thankful for you all kind of sticking through this process. Commissioner Boley, um, I appreciate um, that you share my concerns, uh, Mayor, with the changes. I would underline that these have been very positive changes over the years, and that I've been dealing with them for a couple of years longer than you have, so I <laughs> go back a little further. But I, I, I would like to also um, second the gratitude that you've expressed to the staff um, for providing us with this uh, during a difficult time. Um, I think that they've done an excellent job. I'm very supportive of the capital improvement program. I like the fact that they've separated the three components, capital improvement, vehicle equipment replacement, and maintenance. Those are very significant for us to, to have as separate uh, ideas and, and actualities. Um, and and I appreciate the work that's gone into the operating budget. And, and my question that I would have would be, what direction are you looking for, um, for from us this evening? This is City Manager Craig Owens. Um, th this really was to get it laid out to you and to the public and to uh, start answering questions. Uh, this input that you've given, um, is is he useful to us in case we need to prepare for additional um, additional changes? But this really culminates into any adjustments that uh, the city commission ultimately wants to make. Um, I know that you're um, uh, waiting to hear from the public in our public hearing process, which is is an important part of this, and the other um, ways that um, the community can engage in the process. Uh, but the, these feedback items that you're giving us are, are useful and, and we'll be poised to make whatever changes that you may want. But at this time tonight, uh, we, this is really just an information shoot, uh, portion. This is Commissioner Boley. Um, I appreciate hearing that. We've had this for just a few days now. I look forward to having more of an opportunity to uh, dig into this and learn. So um, I'm hoping to be able to ask a few more questions you know, as we go forward between now and the 28th. This is Commissioner Larson here, Lisa Larson. <clears throat> and I just want to also thank staff for the work that they put into this. This, um, I have to admit, this is probably one of the easier budgets I've gone through since I've been here. Um, I've been able to understand it. And, and I think it's just, you know, learning more each year as we do this. But I do want to specifically point out the work that um, the, uh, you know, First of all, everybody's been doing great work, but the work that MSO, the stormwater program that they're starting to put together, I just am, um, I can't tell you how happy I am with, with, with what, they're do what they're doing with um, the program and that they're actually looking at some really good management tools to um, look at this as a more holistic. They're going to work on a whole basin versus piecemealing things together. And the work that they're going to be doing at Ninth and Mississippi is going to make a huge difference for that entire 
Old West Lawrence neighborhood as well as um, just just that stormwater system that runs off from KU. So I am thrilled the plan that they're they're putting together with this, and I just say you know kudos to them and and everybody else who ha has um, had a hand in this budget because I know it wasn't an easy one. Thank you. This is Vice Mayor Finkelbein. I would echo um, some of that. Certainly the. Uh, this is my first time going through the budget, and so it was a little tricky to try to compare year over year, but I certainly found it to be understandable, and, and I certainly appreciate that. A couple things I would highlight uh, in particular is, um, you know, we went through the CIP, you know, back in June, and I asked the question of Jeremy at the end of that, as we went through a list of whatever 50-odd-some projects, I said, well, how many of these do you think we can fund? And I believe the answer was, well, maybe nine or 10 of them. And now we have a plan before us um, that we're gonna be doing $51 million worth of projects plus 239 million over the next five years. That is a significant investment um, in this community. And I think important, very important going forward. And, you know, going back to the MSO issue, a lot of these projects all involved in water, wastewater, and stormwater. And I remember when I, you know, first became a commissioner and we were talking about some of these issues and I saw it again tonight, something that really struck me, which is, you know, when you look at what you should be replacing, one of it is the probability of failure, but the consequence of that failure. And, you know, the consequence of the failure of a water line or a consequence of failure when you have stormwater flooding your house is very significant, uh, especially when you compare it to the consequence of failure of a road, for example. You know, someone might, um, you know, obviously we want good roads, but consequence of failure is left. And we spend some time, um, I think we've, we've fallen behind in looking at um, water, wastewater, and stormwater projects. And, and and certainly as we talk about climate change and, and folks mention more severe events, these are things we have to get on top of and have to get on top of now. So I really appreciate this capital improvement plan that allows us to address significant um, issues in those areas. But it also allows us to address significant issues, for example, in the Parks and Rec Department. They have more projects in, these, in this next year than they've had in the last two or three years together. Um, as we've struggled with the Parks and Rec budget the last couple of years. So to see some investment in some of our parks, especially in this time where more, more people are spending more time in the parks and more time outside, I think is important. So it's a really exciting CIP um, project, but I think it's also one that focuses on um, you know, very useful aspects. Um, and finally, I think the economic development side of that. I mean, some of the, the national news is about cities cutting back on projects cities not um, funding infrastructure um, you know I'm hopeful that as we start on some of these projects and we're spending this money maybe we get better deals maybe they come in under budget because um, we're willing to um, in, invest in this important time but it's also going to mean, mean people in our community working on our projects so I'm very excited about this budget and, and going forward and certainly we want to look at the the waste water, the fee structures, but um, you know, I think those are fees that are invested in very important projects. So I'm certainly open to to looking at those fee increases. Mayor Ananda, is there anything else from the commission or anything that um, you would like to hear from us, uh, Craig? Uh, City Manager Craig Owens, no, I, I really appreciate the feedback and, and the response, um, and um, we look forward to the rest of the process. Uh, we really do, and encourage you to continue to explore it and uh, and reach out to us with any clarifications or questions as we're going along, and that includes the public, obviously. Thank you very much. Okay, well, I guess with that, we are finished with our work session. Thank you all. Have a great night. Thank you.